Today is November the 20th, 2015. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and today we are in Stillwater to interview Marianne Chitwood, and this is part of our O State Stories project, so thank you for being here today. Thank you. And I should say this is because Marianne is retiring after 31 years with the library. <laughs> she started yesterday, November the 19th, 19th. 84. 31 years ago. 31 years. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but let's <laughs> let's start at the beginning and work our way forward, beginning with when and where you were born. I was born on November the 23rd, 1940, Perry, Oklahoma, in my grandma Coe's house. That's my dad's mother, and uh, I was early. <laughs> born at home, early happy birthday, then it's coming up. That's right. So you started here about this time you were celebrating your birthday too. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, okay. Yeah. And you were born at home? Yeah. Uh, and a home? I was born in my grandma's house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have brothers and sisters? Well, I have, uh, well, I had three brothers and a, and, a, and, I, and a sister. But one of my brothers, the middle brother, died a few years ago. He was a preacher. And where are you in the order? Oh, I'm in the middle. <laughs> I have a younger brother and a younger sister and two older brothers. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, my dad was, uh, well, start off just so you'll know what he was like. He was in the Army, but he was an Army cook. So he was a good cook and we ate well. My, my mother, I'm glad she can't hear this or see this, but she couldn't boil water. <laughs> I mean, she tried, but she, it just wasn't her thing. And uh, my mother was uh, one of these very quiet introverts. She was one of 10 kids. And uh, she was the, she was with all them kids because she had five brothers too. <laughs> anyway, right now I, I can, I know when she was born, but I don't know her placement in the other girls. I never put their, worried about their ages or nothing. But anyway, she was a very sickly child. Even up in, I think she even missed a, a year of school because she was sick. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, I hope that's right because I have a brother that's a genealogist and I'm sure he'll correct me. <laughs> but anyway, but my mom was just a very nice, pleasant person. She smiled a lot and you never knew what she was thinking. And, uh, but she took care of us. What was her name? Oh, Alice Elizabeth Kirtley Coe. K-O-C-H, that's my uh, maiden name. Her mother was Curtly. My dad was the code. Okay. I should say, what was his name then? Oh, I'm sorry. Clarence Melvin. And were they from Oklahoma? Yes, they were. Uh, well, now, yeah. Their, their parents were in the land runs that they, Oklahoma had. Oh. And they, now, I know a little bit about the history, but... I don't want to put this down where someone can say, well, hey, I didn't write. <laughs> I used to remember a lot of the details, but not anymore. Do you know where they came from to get here? Well, uh, one family came from Kansas, and I believe that was my dad's folks. And, and uh, I think they lived in Hayward for a while. <clears throat> and as far as what they did, I would say they were, they were both families were primarily farmers. And uh, my mom's folks were originally there. I, know, I don't know why, but I know a little bit about them more than others, probably because I just saw them more, even though they both lived in town eventually. And, uh, uh, but my grandma, Curtly, her, her name was Soko, S-O-K-O-L. I think that's how you spelled it. And uh, she was, uh, her family was from the old Czechoslovakia, so I always tell everybody, I'm a bohunk and a gypsy. And they even said that I am reminded them of, of uh, somebody in their family that I was one of these happy people that laughed a lot and liked music and I was a gypsy. <laughs> so evidently, I, I, uh, that's the traits that I got. And, uh, but that, uh, and I don't know the uh, years and stuff of when they came to the United States and then, but the, I just know they came up from up north somewhere. It might have been like Idaho or Iowa, but I wouldn't guarantee it. Anyway, but they were in the land run too. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know if it was the same one, because you know there was a couple that, mm -hmm. anyway. 
but uh, 1893 is the one I think I know for sure my grandma was in. And they landed in Perry. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had a farm north of Perry. They they got some acreage there. And I don't know. I was telling somebody the other day that my uh, you know I used to live out of town, so when we'd come home, we'd do a lot of roaming around. But, and I, we would go to my grandma Kirtley's farm north of Perry, and it was they had big hills, and on the top of these one of these little hills, you could still see the imprints of where the buffaloes were. I always thought that was odd because it had to be so many years, but it's you could still see them. They weren't real deep or nothing, but it was interesting. And for a little kid too, it'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> buffalo walls. <laughs> oh, but it was it was. There was a lot. Uh, my family liked, but I guess because there were so many of us, it was it was interesting to hear the histories. And when I was um, uh, in high school, I can remember my grandparents talking, or at least my grandmother, my grandfather was Curly was a character. My see, I, I need to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get out of order because I think of things as I'm talking. That's okay. <clears throat> But my, my dad's dad died when he was in high school. So I never knew him. And, but my grandma, Co, uh, lived to be uh, about um, 92, I think. But there was a reason why she didn't live longer. Um, but I remember her, she had, a, she had a bad fall, I think it was in the 50s. So she went around the rest of the, her life with a crutch. She never got rid of it. I don't know if she actually needed it, but you ne you never saw her without it. And then, uh, just before her uh, night, say that her when she was going close to being ninety two, she had another fall because she lived by herself. She never had anybody with her after, you know. I said her husband had died, and uh, she had another bad fall, and uh, she was on some step coming out of a door and broke her hip. Well, when you fall at that age, you are so fragile. She just didn't. She only lived like six more months, mm -hmm. and uh, but I can picture her as she was very independent, and the older she got, the more careful you were eating her pies, especially pecan pies, because they had lots of shells in them, <laughs> and uh, and we all knew it. But we always made the effort. <laughs> we had lots of napkins, <laughs> wiped the faces a lot. And uh, and uh, I, I picture my grandma sitting in her chair in her house because I'm going to do this a lot. Every time I say something, I think of something else. That's why when I write, and I like to write, there's a lot of it, but it's not in any kind of order. <laughs> but anyway, I picture my grandma sitting with a lamp beside her and reading her Bible. That's the kind of person she was. And she was faithful about going to church. <clears throat> uh, our fam as far as family gatherings, we always, uh, we didn't always go to each, uh, well, I, well, Thanksgiving and Christmas were the biggest ones, and maybe Easter. And uh, we might have even traded off a few times. But I, I remember mostly Christmas was, was at my Grandma Curley's, at my mom's, mom, uh, mom's place. And um, my dad's mom is where we usually spent. You know, I think I'm getting this reversed. You're going to do a lot of cutting, aren't you? Okay. It was the other way around. Christmas was at my grandma Coe's. We spent Christmas Eve at my, my grandma Curly's. And uh, we had big meals. We were all, all good cooks, wonderful cooks. Especially since my, my mom was from such a big family. It was always a happy time. We had lots to talk about and things to do. And we all got along. And then on my dad's side, he had one, uh, two sisters. And uh, I think he was, you know, I don't know if he was the oldest. I don't know the order of the verse. But anyway. Well, I was curious who taught him how to cook, your dad. The Army. The Army did. Yeah. Yeah. The Army. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shoot. Where do you want me to get? Well, at the holidays, like at Christmas, what would that? What would be on the table to eat? What would oh, be the, your, fa your favorite thing that they that they cook? If you had one, I uh, well, because my dad was a good cook, you know, I don't remember exactly everything that he fixed, but they were always good meals. 
And uh, but and like I said, everybody in my family was a good cook. So I don't, I can't, I just picture lots and lots of food on the tables piled up because you would all scatter around and very few people could eat at a table. You were scattered all over the house or on the floor, wherever they could fit you. And, uh, there, and there was every size range in the world because there were so many <laughs> of those. My mom's family had married and had kids and those kids had kids. It was a house full. And, uh, but the food was always good. But as far we, uh, you know, I don't picture a turkey for Thanksgiving, but you know it was there. Like I said, that food was something that was good, but I just ate what was there and didn't pay that much particular. Anyway, but like I said, my dad was an army cook, and that's how he learned to cook. Now, he did other things other than that, but that's his, that was the main thing that I knew about my dad. And uh, like I said, my mother couldn't. Because of boil water, and then she'd try occasionally to make a cake, but it was always split down the middle. <laughs> but she did try, and uh, she made us sure us kids. Uh, she uh, was real particular about telling us what to wear to school, and uh, we never liked what she suggested. And then, uh, well, where did you go to school? I, I went elementary to, school on up. I went to elementary school all the way through high school in Perry, Oklahoma. The the grade school was in a different part of town, and uh, <clears throat> what was the name of it? Again? Just uh, Perry. Uh, it was just Perry Grade School, Perry and, uh, and then the yeah Perry Elementary Grade School, or how, how you know I never thought about what it was called Perry Elementary School probably, and then the uh, Perry's or the high school was just Perry High School. We were the Maroons, <laughs> and the cheer the cheer squad was the uh, uh, shoot I'm gonna remember this forget this why did they call me this. I'll have to think of it. It just left me. I'll what year did it. you graduate from high school? 1959. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite subject? You know, I liked, I liked school. And uh, I'll tell you what I didn't like. Because <laughs> I liked school. I, I was, uh, you know, back then, things didn't have names like they do now. But I think I might have had a, a learning disability in math. Because up until, the, the say, the sixth grade, I, I was one of those people who liked school, so I did my homework and all that kind of stuff, and I made good grades. And I made a few B's, but uh, mostly A's. But then when I got to about the seventh grade, and you had algebra and that kind of stuff and geometry, it was like if I couldn't see it, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you do all that other stuff you do, you have figures written down where you actually see them, and you, you can. I would. I didn't have any trouble with that. And I mean, I could have a whole bunch of numbers, but I could do them, and I could still do them really well like that. But the algebra, I was a lost cause. Geometry wasn't horrible, but it wasn't good because it was like drawing pictures. Forget algebra. And in those two classes, I always tell everybody I was in a class where all the football players were. <laughs> I don't remember too many girls around me. And uh, maybe they stuck me in that class because they thought we all needed the most help. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> it was a lost cause. I think, I, I honestly believe, because I had made such good grades, the, my teacher, who happened to be the same man each for each of those last two years I was in school, uh, as far as, you know, I don't know what I took in 11th and 12th grade because I remember uh, the algebra and and all, but it seemed like it was a little earlier than being a junior or a senior. I don't know if you had to take math every year or not. I just don't remember. I put that out of my mind. <clears throat> and I'm going to get distracted and forget what I was telling you. Well, was college on your radar? I think I passed those classes because the teacher felt sorry for me, and I got a D plus. <laughs> Oh well, that's just life. I'm. Uh, oh well. <laughs> a D, 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 D. <laughs> the bad stuff. Dumb plus. <laughs> but I knew I. Oh well, I accepted it. I was just glad I got through. You had talents in other areas. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I don't mean to sound. <laughs>
<laughs> I get to ask that a lot just because of things I've done in my later part of my life. But when I was a, a you have to understand that I wasn't one of these people who mixed well with other people. I always felt like I was in a lower class than my classmates. I, honest, I did. It was, and uh, I think I need to tell you about where I lived and how we lived before I tell you about my school days. Okay. My dad was one of these people that, you know, it was tough times when he got out of the army and trying to uh, feed his family and, and find a job that he could do. He, he's had so many jobs, I couldn't even tell you all of them. But when, he, when, when I was growing up, this was from about six years up, because uh, up until I was five years old, uh, I remember where I lived. I lived by my mom's, I think my house, our house was right next to my mom's mother's house. And it was on Cedar Street, Perry. And uh, there was a lot, families back then, you, a matter of fact, I had another aunt that lived in that area too. So we were close to each other and we could help each other out. And uh, I think that's where we were living when my dad was in the army. And then when he got back home, he got a job somewhere in there after the Army, uh, working at, for the city of Perry, and uh, he took care of the parks. Well, because the, uh, we had a football stadium that was on, it was in an area where it was on one end, and on the other end was the baseball field. And then on the other side, one side was the highway, highway I think it's 177, and the other one uh, it was just a dirt road, and there was a huge hole in the ground where the city of Perry uh, got rock and dirt and stuff. So I was out in the middle of a lot of dangerous territory. <laughs> but uh, where I was living is the unusual part. <clears throat> and my dad was the, one, the person who took care of the stadium, which had the football and the baseball field. There was a what used to be a dressing room for the athletes. There were two dressing rooms. One of them still existed and, that, and they used it. But the other one, they made it into a house. It was made of uh, sandstone and it wasn't that big and the rooms weren't that big. And uh, I think it was two bedroom because my brothers and I all had more like twin beds. In, and we all slept in the same room, and then my mom and dad had their room. And uh, the windows were those windows that were up real high, but they were only the narrow rectangular, so you didn't see anything. In the summers, it was cool, and uh, in the winters, it was cold. <laughs> and as far as we had, we had our own playground because of all the activities that would be there, like they would have their, uh, uh, I don't know, see, what do you call it when they have track and track and field, those kind of days. Well, they would leave things laying out until they were done using them. You know, in other words, it might last a week or so, whatever events were taken on. So a lot of this stuff, we would use it and play with it. I can remember learning to pole vault. <laughs> it's wonder we'd kill ourselves, but... Anything my brother did, I did, since uh, there was three boys and I was the only girl because my sister didn't come along until I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So I, w I, I didn't know how to be a girl. Yeah, I didn't learn anything from my mother. And, uh, and because she did have sisters, I had one aunt in particular who would uh, take, uh, I don't know if she took them all we never went anywhere at the same time, not very often. But she would keep us for a couple of weeks and make us feel special and buy clothes for us and make clothes for us. And it was really nice because we got a lot of special attention. And, uh, and, and because my mom's family, was, she was raised in a Christian family. We, they all had uh, uh, good lifestyles where... Like, I, I don't know how to explain it. When I say my mom was, she was just very quiet and kept to herself. She didn't talk a whole lot. And uh, so we learned a lot from her sisters, the ones who took care of us. And, uh, and uh, I'm 
really glad. I, I think I'm the person I am because of one of my aunts that, that I tell everybody that she more or less raised me. But she was one who taught me about keeping good manners and trying to be clean and neat and friendly. And uh, so, so I did have one special aunt, but I liked we liked them all. And then on my uh, dad's side, they were just. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. They were just, they kept more to themselves. I never saw them as much as I did my mom's family, and I'm not real sure why. Uh, wouldn't know how to explain it, but they were all friendly. And like I said, <laughs> we had a good time when we were together. <clears throat> Mainly, probably because we were spending, we spent our holidays together. But because of where I lived in that stadium, it was a, it was a football and baseball stadium. <clears throat> Had a sandstone uh, wall all the way around it. I mean, all the way around it until you got to one side, the side that had the hole and stuff. And it was just like it was only part way. So I never saw anything except those walls and those giant uh, field lights. And they were, they were, one of those field lights was a little bit farther than that wall. In other words, if I had opened my back door, it just more or less almost hit you in the face. And uh, it was really scary when there was a bad electrical storm. Because <laughs> lightning likes to hit that stuff that's up there high. And uh, I can tell you one occasion, the, this, uh, the floors in this building we lived in were concrete. And uh, I think, uh, I can't remember any carpeting. I think it was all linoleum or something like that. But I know this one room, we called it the storeroom, was at the back end of the house that was next to where the football stadium is. And the door, back door opened up, and like I said, the first thing you saw was those light poles, or at least one of them, and they were huge. But I happened to be standing at that door with the door open, and a lightning bolt hit the pole. Well, you can understand if I'm here and that pole's right there, it literally knocked me onto the floor. And my family, my brothers and sisters, we were all there. You know, I, I don't remember where my dad was, but uh, they said I was unconscious, but it couldn't have been for more than a minute or two. But I remember seeing blue lights, and uh, my uh, brothers told me that they, they saw blue lights too because it, it I guess all the light bulbs in the, all my lamps, the lamps in the house, they did something where, I don't know if it, it blew a fuse or what it did. It was evidently pretty scary. <laughs> but uh, but I, I had no obvious damage from it other than it knocked me on the ground. But I'll never forget it. <laughs> I remember those blue lights. <laughs> Anyway, that was just a little side story. <laughs> you must have had on rubber, rubber sole shoes. Well, you know, we didn't wear shoes much, so <laughs> I don't know. Don't remember. Anyway, but this, this room I was in, we called it the storeroom because that's probably what it was, or part of it might have been, because that's where our bathroom was. We didn't have a, a what you would call a bathroom, you know, with the, the basin and the big mirror and faucets, all that stuff. Uh, I remember the commode, and there, and there must have been a shower head like uh, the athletes would use to take a shower because there was nothing on the floor. It was just concrete, and it, there was a drain in the floor, and that's where my mom did her washing. She had a washing machine and two wash tubs, one for the bluing and the rinse, and the other, uh, the, let's see, what did she use? That, that was for wash. She had two. I'm not sure why they had two, but, uh, but anyway, I'm getting off. <laughs> But it just, we didn't have a bathtub. So anything you did, you did it with the shower. So, And uh, it, was just, it was just a lot of room in there for you to be in there all by yourself. And of course, we only had one bathroom at, uh, for, any, for all of us to go to. So I don't remember the lock-in system or nothing. But it was private. <laughs> And you had to make sure you didn't ever open, have that door open that was because it opened right up out into the field. <laughs> but anyway, on the back side of our house, we had a, a, uh, a small area where my dad had some kind of workshop 
area where he, uh, other than just whatever he was working on, I think he had a little table in there. We, there was chickens in there too. <laughs> you had to be careful where you walked. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, we did have a garden, but it was on the other side of the road and it was a great big garden. And uh, back then I was, young, I was young enough, we didn't have to worry about helping with any of the tilling and, and put stuff in the ground, but we did have to help uh, get what was in the garden out. I can remember going out there and barefooted and stepping on on those those stickers that was like like horny horny toes. What you, I can't remember what we called them things. Cockleburs is what I think. Well, think well, they weren't cockleburs, but boy, they were they hurt if you got them. And got, like I said, we didn't wear shoes much. It was a lot of dirt around there and a lot of rocks, and. Uh, we didn't, I don't remember a whole lot of toys. I tell her, I tell my kids that when I grew up, uh, we played in the dirt with the rocks and uh, sticks and used our imagination. My brothers had, uh, they had two bicycles. I didn't have one of my own. And uh, to give you another little story, I don't know how long I was supposed to talk because I could talk all day long. Oh, I've been alive right. a long time, 75 years. <laughs> but anyway, like I said, we were out in the middle of where, nowhere, and we more or less did what we wanted, because uh, I, I guess you'd say we were very unsupervised. We were more or less on our own. I know my dad slept in the in the day a lot, so he might have had more than one job for all I know. Anyway, <sighs> did your classmates know that that's where you lived? Uh. It was probably a while before they did. They knew I had to ride. We had to ride school bus to school, and they knew where I got off. And uh, we didn't go towards the houses. We went to the stadium. There was a an entryway, and uh, it was a nice looking stadium. It was kept neat. Well, my dad kept it clean and neat. And uh, I just know that they knew that we were more. We were poor. Uh, I. Most of my clothes were hand-me-downs. The only nice things I had would be things that my, my mom's family would give to us. Like, like, that's one reason why I like this one aunt in particular. She, she'd buy me pretty clothes to wear. And then, of course, what I remember growing up and wearing all the time was gathered skirts, because they were easy to bake. <laughs> you just gathered the waist, put a band on it, and hemmed it. Mm -hmm. And as far as tops, I don't remember much about the tops. Uh, it was just classic blouse, and uh, like I said, when we went to school we wore shoes, but when we were at home, they were gone. <laughs> you know, that's probably why I'm flat-footed. <laughs> anyway, of course boys, it was not so much, you didn't wear jeans back then, or girls didn't. If you did, you had to wear a skirt over them, or wear them under your dress or skirt. I don't know what they thought we were going to do with them. <laughs> Just because I'm a girl don't mean I'm going to run around. Well, I did grow up with boys, but I didn't act like a boy when I was going to school. I was just a girl. But because of our isolation in the stadium, I really believe this is why I didn't know how to interact with other people. I didn't have any friends. The mo I saw, I, everybody I saw was usually a boy or a man. There weren't any girls coming to the stadium except for maybe the, the uh, field field day, of, you know, track track meets. But I I didn't have any contact with them. But the only girls I knew were the older ones, and then uh, they very rarely came to our place for any events, simply because it would have been so crowded and there wasn't room for anybody. Because we had so many, we always met at my uh, grandma Curly's house or at my grandma Cole's house. We Never, never met at my house. Now we weren't. Uh, people did come. Family did come to see us, but usually it was the older ones. It wasn't the kids. The kids weren't with them. They came more or less to see my mother, they, and uh, <coughs> not necessarily us kids. And uh, <laughs> like I said, it sounds awful, but it was kind of like being in a prison. I mean, I didn't see anybody. And then when I got to school, I didn't know how to intermix. And uh, I never had any friends who were girls. And 
I had enough brothers. I sure didn't want to mess with any of the others. But I, maybe that's why I like school so much. I had somebody who was telling me what to do and uh, teaching me something. And uh, I just, I always liked school and tried to do my best. And uh, I pretty much did all of it at school. I don't remember doing a whole lot at home. Uh, I know that every year for Christmas, we got a new binder, you know, one of them things you zip up and put your papers and stuff in, and pencils, and maybe a new box of crayons. And uh, that was our Christmas. And, and it, I don't remember, I don't really don't remember any toys. I think uh, I did get a, a few dolls through the years, and uh, but my brothers worked too kindly to them. So they didn't last long. They had a lot of crushed heads. And uh, uh, I did learn to ride a bicycle on my brother's bicycles. And one of the events where I was trying to be just like them, I just about killed myself. I mentioned there was a there was this big hole in the ground. Well, to get into this place where they got the dirt and the rocks, there was a very steep incline uh, entryway where the big trucks would go down. And that's where my brothers liked to ride their bikes go roaring down that gravel road, gravel, my, and it wasn't that little stuff, it was the big stuff. Well, I decided if they could do it, I could do it. So I convinced them that it was my turn, they should let me have a ride going down that hill. I got on that bike. I probably had to have some help getting on it because it was big too big for me. I got down the hill all right, but I, I didn't know when to stop. <laughs> I crashed with, flipped off of that bicycle head first into that gravel. and. Uh, you know, I don't know what it did to me. I, I kind of remember running, running down the, got back up the hill and ran to the house. And uh, it's like uh, I, I've hit my head a lot of times doing things I wasn't supposed to. That, um, and it was several times I did stuff like this when we lived there. But um, on this one occasion, I remember going running to the house, and I didn't even realize it, but somebody from my mom's family was visiting so there was somebody there and there was a wire across the road boy you talk about adding insult to injury i got i gave myself a neck job running into a wire because the people would drive down this little side road it wasn't it was for us and for the dirt the big old trucks and there would be people who'd want to come to the stadium and mess around in the stands in the fields, but to keep them out, they put a, a clothesline wire across the road, and I ran right into it. But anyway, by the time I got to the house, I don't think I was even conscious. I, I, I was, uh, I guess you'd call semi-conscious, but when I got to the house, I remember getting there, and then uh, all of a sudden it dawned on me. I, I was sitting there talking to these people who were visiting my mom, but I didn't remember, I don't know when they got there. They, they were probably already there when I walked into the house. But I had, such, I had enough trauma to my poor head that I wasn't quite with it. <laughs> but I, I really think that the reason I am so tough now <laughs> is because I survived so much. And uh, I guess it just makes you tougher. I don't know. Either that or I have a really thick skull. <laughs> oh, God, see, this makes me think of all the things that's happened to me. It was when I was five years old. This is when we were living on Cedar Street, and there are all these relatives. My mom, this is why my dad was still gone, and my mom uh, would go visit with her sisters. And one time she left. It was in the, um, I don't know why. I don't remember what time of year it was. I just remember because of what happened. Uh, my mom said we couldn't follow her. And my, my brothers were in the house and I had my older brother. Uh, he was the man of the house. So I decided I was gonna go anyway. So he grabbed me by the arm and pulled me back into the room. Well, he pulled me hard enough. I fell into this wrought iron black stove that was in our living room and I, I split my eyebrow right here. And uh, I just remember lots of blood. Don't know whose car we in because my mom did not drive. But they got me to the, our family doctor. And uh, I don't remember how many stitches I had, but I had a nice big scar there. 
And would you believe that same year, probably in the summer, my brothers were playing ball with a bat and a ball to each other in my backyard, and they wouldn't let me play with them. So I was just dragging a rope along in the dirt, and I thought, I'll show them. I'll get in their way. I walked right in front of them and got hit in the same place with the ball bat. Same, exactly the same place. You could just barely see the separation of where the scar was. And it was, it was in this eyebrow. <laughs> And, and I probably don't even have all my eyebrow hairs in there anyway. But to have that happen to me twice, like I said, I got hit in the head or something in my head all the time. <laughs> I guess it was because I, could, I was acting like a boy all the time. I should have been acting like a girl. Yeah. But anyway, but I survived that too. But like I said, it uh, didn't seem to harm my brain any. <laughs> Okay, stop that right there. I gotta get back on track. When you say your dad was gone, was that he was he in World War Two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean yes. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> anyway, you would have been four or five, five, six. Well, see, I was, when, he was gone. when I was five, and then all the, that stuff was happening to me on Cedar Street. I, every all all my mom's sister's husbands were in some kind of service. So I was used to seeing lots of uniforms around and I really don't remember a whole lot in that stage of my life. Uh, I just remember where I lived and a couple of uh, funny little things that happened in but they were memorable to me is why I remember but that's about it. And I can remember my mom braiding my hair and I went somewhere I, I don't know if I got on a bus or what I did but I, just, I know I was going to school somewhere, <laughs> and so uh, I know I was five and six when this stuff happened with my eyebrow, and uh, I don't know when exactly, I think I was probably around maybe close to nine or maybe in that area when we moved to the stadium, and uh, like I said, we had a lot of things that happened to us there. Were you still there when you graduated from high school? Oh, no. Uh, my dad changed jobs many times. And uh, when I was maybe 11 or 12, somewhere in there, <clears throat> we never owned our own home. Every place we were living was either provided or we rented. And my now, I know this is hard to picture, but you know how when a town growls, it gr grows, it just, things kind of pop up and get surrounded. Well, there was this great big two-story house with a, a, a uh, at least, there was a porch that wrapped around the front and side. And so it was a, a neat place, and I think somebody rented the upstairs. Uh, either that or it was just there, and for some reason we couldn't use it. We used the bottom part. It didn't have much of a backyard, but on one side of it was this big sandstone building that belonged to Slumberjay. So there, here we go. They would bring these old tar trucks and stuff, and I grew up hating the smell of tar because we also had those same trucks were out there where I lived at the stadium too. But my uh, brothers and I learned how to, we used tar for chewing gum. <laughs> You don't need to do that if it's clean. Well, that's what we did, and it felt, it was kind of waxy, but it was like chewing bubble gum. I don't remember how long we chewed it, and it didn't turn our teeth black, far as I know. <laughs> when it never stuck together. And uh, uh, see, see how easy I get sidetracked. Everything I do or remember tells me another story that I thought, oh, shoot, I can't leave that out either. So I could be here all day long. <laughs> But anyway, now you see I got sidetracked, forgot what I was going to tell you. Oh, where we live. Yeah. Anyway, here's this house. Here's the big old Slumber Jays. And it's not far from the town square. It probably wasn't meant to be only maybe two, maybe three blocks from the town square, Perry. And on the other side of me was a, a car lot. There was some kind of businesses that were next to it where I remember just the glass fronts. And there was, and, uh, and there was a soil. I, I, we lived next door to these, it wasn't a big lot, but it was, it might have been, it was probably, they had used cars there and the new cars were in the building, I think. And then across the street from us, there was a, a one of these little white frame houses that you picture 
uh, remember Little House on the Prairie? It looked like a one-room schoolhouse. Those, the little house was about that size. It was little. But this, this older German man and woman lived there. They spoke English, but they, they pronounced uh, all their, was it, is it, what is it? It's the V's they pronounce like a W. <laughs> I remember that. But they shared their cellar with us. And uh, um, and then on beyond Slumber Jays, there was a, a a place that sold chickens, little baby chickens. And I don't remember what else was on the other end. But in other words, if it wasn't for that little house across the street, it was like we were living in the middle of town. <laughs> but it was a big old house, and had and and uh, as a matter of fact, on the other end of the at the end of the block across the street, there was a lumber yard. And the reason it made me think of that was because that lumber yard caught fire one time and we stood on our porch and watched it burn. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of scary because it wasn't that far away, especially if it had spread. But I can tell you, every story I tell you, I can think of a whole bunch more that just because of the time and the place, I can, it makes me remember other things that happened too. <laughs> well, if you live that close to town, the Carnegie Library wasn't far off. Yeah, the Carnegie Library was... Uh, it, the square was really a square, and the library was on the on the uh, far side of the square. In other words, I was I was on this side, and you'd have the whole square and a courthouse, and then the Carnegie Library was on the corner. And I did go to that library a lot. I did. After I I'd come home from school. Sometimes I'd go straight to the library, but cause everything I did I walked, because when I was in high school, it was only um, well, I don't know how many blocks it was, but it wasn't far. It was close enough that I could walk it. It might have been, let's see, 8th Street. My, well, what's even funnier is my grandma currently lived across the street from the area where the high school was. Yeah, see, see I, I think of things when I'm <laughs> picturing it in my mind. And it was just a typical high school that you see pictures of uh, the brick buildings and the double pane or, or double windows, you know, next to each other and all. And, uh, I can't remember if it was two, it must have been just two story. But that's where I went to high school. And uh, there was a junior high, which was close to there, but a little farther on down. And that's, and uh, since I was, uh, I think the sixth grade was the last grade I was in before we moved. When I was in grade school, I had one, my dad's sister and her husband and family lived across the street from the school grounds. <laughs> so I, it's, it's, it's funny, but I was, I was around a lot of family a lot of times because they were just spread out in just the right places. So if I, if I had to, I can remember going to my aunt's house and waiting for somebody to pick me up if for some reason, because every time while I was in school, I rode the school bus until I got in high school. And then I just started walking because it was where I was living. That was when I lived in the big house between the businesses. And, uh, yep. <laughs> well, you graduated in 1959. Yes. Then what did you do? Oh, gosh. Well, it's before, do, while you were in high school, did you think about coming to Oklahoma A&M? Oh. Uh, let's put it this underwater? way. I made, I made really good grades, like I said. And then in the, the that little time period where I had, the math I couldn't handle brought my grade average down enough that I could have gotten a small scholarship, but then my dad would have had to pay for the rest. And uh, back back then, there weren't a whole lot of things that somebody could do for a job, especially that would make you enough money to to do something to go to college on. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I knew that even though I was offered a small scholarship it wasn't going to be enough to get me through school that I knew my dad wouldn't have anything to help me with. And I sure didn't have anything. So uh, my dad was, like I said, he had a lot of jobs. One of the last jobs he had was a policeman. And uh, he uh, had enough friends, knew enough people that he knew how my, my oldest brother graduated, I think it was in 56. And he got a job working for the FBI as a fingerprint expert in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I was going to graduate and I didn't have a clue what I was going to do, 
I thought, I'll go to work for the FBI too. So I had an interview and uh, I got the job. And you have to understand that I spent time with family it's away from home, but I'd, I'd never been anywhere by myself. So my, because my brother was already there, he came home and I graduated, it, I think it was May the 21st, 1959. And it was just, it was in the first part of July, after the 4th of July, he was at home and he drove me and a roommate of his back to Washington, D.C. And he had already found me roommates and a place to live and because it was in the area where he was living too and so when I went to Washington DC I didn't know a soul there except my brother and uh, the roommates he picked for me were just really nice homey people and uh, nobody that made me nervous or out of place and uh, uh, he had been there I had been there three months <laughs> and he was drafted to Korea now it was during peacetime, but he, but this they were still drafting people, so so I was on my own then, and uh, I didn't have a car, every, everywhere I went, and my friends didn't have cars either. We all rode buses, and uh, it was a pretty good ways from where I lived to where I worked, but it was a it was a pretty much a straight shot there, <laughs> so I, it wasn't that hard for me to figure out. But I can remember one time getting lost where I decided to do a little touring. <laughs> well, I got lost. I couldn't, I couldn't remember how to get back where I came from. And uh, I think somebody must have just uh, found me and told me how to find the bus that would get me back to where I needed to go. But that was pretty scary. Here I was when I was... Uh, out in high school, but I wasn't an adult yet. <laughs> Eighteen years old. Well, oh no, shoot! No, you weren't. Well, see, with your, with your now, birthday see, in November. Well, I was seven. I was uh, old when I started school because, anyway, okay. when I graduated, I was already eighteen. Okay. And uh, and then, uh, so I was eighteen and a half when I went to Washington D.C. And uh, very nice brother to help you do all that. <sighs> Yeah, it was, and uh, he had a car. <laughs> Not that I was in it much. He didn't leave it for you oh, while, no. while he was gone. No, you know I don't know what he did with it. Never thought about it. <laughs> I can. He had more than one. My heck, my family, the men folk, cars was their thing. And what's funny is a married guy. He was a car nut too. But <laughs> maybe I was just and anyway. <laughs> what What was your job in D.C. Well, when I went there, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. They give you an aptitude test. And uh, however they figured it, they decided I could be a fingerprint expert. And what they, it took us 90 days, I think. We learned to recognize each of the types of prints. And we learned how to classify them and learned how to fill out fingerprint cards, just looking at them. And we had a special, uh, little marks and things that we used to show uh, the direction the loops or the fingerprints were going, they, especially loops. We had arches and they looked like arches. <laughs> and we had whorls, which were whorls. And uh, you learned how to count ridges of the fingerprints and you learned to identify things that made them stand out because when you had to search to find the matching fingerprints and we, this, we were given something that we had to find it and because uh, it was just a copy of another fingerprint card but anyway we would search through them and you would you stood you were on your feet when we started they, they put us in an area in what they called the identification building and it was mostly all fingerprints and I think it was a seven-story building oh yeah these were everybody um, all the think of the picture all these sheriff's office police departments all the services, because they had civil as well as criminal records. And, uh, and they had the old metal file cabinets, the kind that were about this wide, and maybe hit me about right here. And uh, 
you had to be careful because when you pulled the drawer out, you were more or less searching a lot of times, practically the whole drawer. You'd take out as much as you could if you couldn't do it through the drawer and set it on the, on the cabinet on top of it. And you learned how to put your hand behind it and you'd learn how to use your fingers and you know how you, you flip pages to make a cartoon? That's what you were essentially doing. When you were flipping those, those uh, fingerprint cards, it was like watching a uh, slow motion movie. Your eyes were focused on that one spot and you didn't look at anything else and you it was you'd see you it was really weird you you'd see it right away when it was there it was there and you knew it <laughs> and then you have to stop and think it was really tiny but we used a uh, what we a uh, an eyeglass which was a, a magnifying glass on a stand with a little stem on it on the side and you just leaned over the cabinet and put that thing down and you'd find, you'd look at all the fingerprints that were on that card. There were, you'd have 10 choices usually, but a lot of people's hands aren't perfectly clean and clear, especially when they were getting fingerprinted. Uh, you, you had to, to find something that made one of those a little bit more easy to see something than all the others. And it was kind of, oh, some of those fingerprints were really hard to even find anything to hunt for. So it was, you had to be paying attention what you were doing. And I learned to do it and I did it good. And uh, <clears throat> um, of course we, <laughs> because it was just these huge rooms with nothing but filing cabinets and people bent over, you know, looking through all these fingerprints. Every now and then you'd get, you'd have to stop and talk to somebody. So there was talking going on, but you didn't talk and do this at the same time. But anyway, if you found a wanted person, you got to stop and take that fingerprint card down to the main office where and give it to them because this is something you wanted to handle right away. All the other stuff, you, you just put it in a pile and say, these are the ones you found, and then you gave them to, you had a supervisor that you give stuff to. And uh, at the same time we were searching uh, the criminal records, we were also searching uh, the, the civil and the criminal were mixed together, in other words. Mm -hmm. So, because they had to be where they were classified, and you wouldn't want to have two separate places search for the same fingerprint. Anyway. Double the work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, a lot of times something you found, you were, uh, you, you didn't know all the time if you were looking for, what you were looking for, just, you were looking for a fingerprint. You didn't know why. Anyway, so. And that was before computers, so. Oh, yes. It's so totally different now. Now, I've never been there to see the computerized version of the way they do things, but it would be beyond my understanding to even try to figure it out. Because I have seen some, uh, uh, the library has some uh, law enforcement magazine type things that would, and they even, had, they even had the exact same book in the government documents department that I learned to do the fingerprints from in our department. It was, it was a federal, uh, it was a, a, a book that was put out, I guess, by the Federal Depository. <laughs> anyway, it was there, because I found it. It didn't, it just all of a sudden there it was. And I thought, oh, this is exactly the same book I learned from. Mm -hmm. And I even had a copy of my own that I, that I have at my house. And it, and somewhere. <laughs> but you know, it's something you never forget. I could still search fingerprints and find the one I'm looking for if I can get in the right place because I don't remember all the details about classifying them. I know the different types of fingerprints, but I couldn't tell you uh, how to locate them in a drawer to look in the right spot anymore. I've forgotten that part. Mm -hmm. But if you just had me a picture of a fingerprint and I had to find a picture of that same fingerprint, I could still do it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, for 4-H uh, and uh, uh, some uh, school classes when my kids were in school, I even gave a couple little talks and showed them how to, you know, I'd, I'd let them uh, make fingerprints with ink and stuff. <laughs> it was pretty neat. They thought I was pretty good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you are? <laughs> well, anybody who was trained for it could do it, but how many people do you know that went to Washington, D.C.? And it, it sounds fantastic to say you're a fingerprint expert. Well, expert wasn't in what I would call it just knew. It just me. I knew how to do search fingerprints and classify them, but I wasn't an expert. You had to have a lot of training to be that. You know, these are the guys who could find little pieces of fingerprints, 
because agents had to go to all these airplane crashes because a lot of times the only way they could identify somebody was just pieces of skin with fingerprints on them. Mm -hmm. And of course you don't have fingerprints just on your fingers. Your body's covered with them. Like none of them, none of them were the type that I would search because everything I did was a fingerprint. But the guys, who, the agents and the especially a tr trained far in advance of what I was, they, they were able to identify just pieces of things. And it, sometimes, it, you know, your lip prints, nobody's lip prints are the same. And there's mm -hmm. something about your tongue, too. And, of course, your toes and the palms of your hands. I mean, it's, it's a miracle you stop and think about that you are so different from somebody. <laughs> anyway, well, how it was long neat. Did, how long did you do that? I did that for, uh, okay. I went to Washington, D.C. in July of 1959, and I think it was December of 61, my mom and dad got divorced somewhere in there in the fall, and like I said, my mom needed somebody to help take care of her and the kids, because she couldn't do it on her own, and she, there was very few things she could have done to earn her keep, because my dad just uh, left, and uh, left, left, he left his family. And uh, so the FBI doesn't normally transfer clerks because agents get tra uh, transferred in about every two years. Mm -hmm. But a clerk, no way. But it was a hardship, so they, they did let me transfer. And I transferred from Washington, D.C. to Oklahoma City, and then I took a train home every weekend, and I would do, help do with the house cleaning, the laundry, and the grocery shopping, and any cooking I could do while I was there. And I did that for... Uh, Three years, mm. and then uh, my my brothers, my brothers were, well, one brother was still in D.C., but the other one was going to college, and uh, he, he's one that eventually became a preacher, and then uh, my youngest brother, he was just, uh, well, I'm three years older than him, and then I had my sister, I was ten years older than my sister, and she was the one that needed somebody to help take care of her, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I lost my train of thought, but it, anyway, my she just my mom couldn't do it on her own. And then when I decided that they were old enough to take care of themselves with my with just my mom there, and I I uh, I knew somebody that I uh, was living in uh, Illinois, and I thought, hmm, <laughs> I'm moving to Illinois. <laughs> No, Ready for a change? Uh, well, change nothing. I was after somebody. <laughs> no, I had I had kept contact with this uh, uh, guy I worked with because he was in fingerprints too. But he was uh, going to college while he was George Washington University while he was working for the FBI, and he had intentions of becoming a uh, FBI agent. Well. I won't go into any great detail, but he didn't become an FBI agent. But he was uh, he became a he became a lawyer eventually, and uh, but I had been with his family a lot, and they and they liked me, and I liked them. They were just really nice people, and uh, I just decided that there was no way I was going to. Uh, get a chance to know this person better and get closer if I wasn't close <laughs> because we wrote letters and stuff and talked on telephone and that kind of stuff but, and uh, didn't and I occasionally get to see him just because his parents were traveling through from one place to go into another and they would stop and make sure wherever I was living that I got to see see them all but anyway so I decided that I wanted to move to Illinois where I could be closer because there was a field office there well, you know, I said they don't normally transfer clerks. Well, I'd gotten transferred one time because I was a hardship case. But the, the second time I actually got transferred, and it was on my request, was because this field office was having trouble keeping full-time people working for them. <laughs> and they were in desperate need of, of clerical help. So they knew I had all this training and, 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 uh, and all administrative type training and this is uh, now moving from Oklahoma City to Illinois, my youth. So they knew I had a little bit of special events in my life that made me a little, a little more attractive to them. And there was, they knew I was an adult and could take care of myself. So I uh, transferred to Springfield, Illinois. And uh, 
now I could go into a lot more detail, but it, it n let's put it this way, it, nothing came to pass. <laughs> I mean, I, I knew this, this guy for 50 years. So I even knew him after I was married and here in, uh, uh, in uh, Oklahoma. And, uh, but he was a friend, in other words. Anyway, he was his friend. <laughs> but then, uh, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, that wasn't that long ago. Anyway, there were some events in his life that I didn't approve of, so I thought, no more. I said, this is enough. And uh, so that was history. But I was in uh, Illinois when I met my husband on a blind date. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. But I was working for the FBI uh, still. And uh, he had just gotten out of the Navy. And he lived, his landlady had a niece who was working for, the, uh, it'd be like kind of like the dean's office uh, in Springfield, Illinois with me in the same building. and. Uh, she told me, this landlady told this girl to tell me that she knew somebody that was just out of the Navy and uh, she wanted to introduce us. So, mm -hmm. well, I, like I said, I chased this one guy for so long. I said, there's no way. If he wants to see me, he's going to come find me. <laughs> so he met, I was on a bowling league at the time. So he met me at this bowling league where, where I was uh, on the team, and uh, I tell my kids first thing you ever saw was my rear end <laughs> putting that bowling ball down the alley. I wasn't a great bowler, but it was a lot of fun to do, and they had a good time. But uh, he took me. I don't remember how. I didn't. I don't think. Well, I didn't have. I never had a car when I was working, so somebody. I had a ride some way to get where I did my bowling. But anyway, he took me. See, I'm trying to think of the name of this place. <laughs> One of them hot, uh, hamburger places. I said hamburgers or whatever it was. <laughs> and he bought me uh, something to eat. And then he took me to my the house that I was living at, where it was a two-story old house with uh, apartments. Well, since it was his house, it didn't, I never thought of it like apartments, but it had rooms downstairs like a, that half of the house where there was a, a couple of girls living there. And then there was a little bitty place, two little bitty places upstairs. And I and it wasn't very big, but that one of them was mine. And then across the hall was some other kids that, that I never really got acquainted with. But uh, anyway, it had a porch swing on the front. <laughs> so we sat on that porch swing. And uh, uh, he asked me for another date. And of course, he was wanting to get acquainted. So sure, I said, yeah, because he's, I just remember driving to my where I was living because uh, I it was a blind date and I didn't date anybody. I, I I didn't date anybody. I never went anywhere, and I and I just remember looking at his profile. I was his driving. And I said, you know, because I'm always I was thinking, is this going to be the guy that I'm going to really like? Because <laughs> I thought I I had a great imagination, and I guess you I guess I was romantic at heart. But anyway, I just remember thinking to myself, you know, he looks kind of like my dad. Mm. He didn't really. <laughs> but uh, he was a man. <laughs> but anyway, he was uh, he's fresh out of the Navy and uh, very clean cut, very neat. And uh, uh, be another story for the rest of all that. But he had an interesting mother. <laughs> but he, was, uh, he had a sister. But uh, she was a lot younger than him, and uh, but we started dating, and uh, he lived uh, uh, 30 miles from where I was working, and I lived, uh, well, I lived there in town, but anyway, he had a car, and uh, now I won't go into all this, all this kind of stuff, because that's not, it has well, nothing to do with say this. Who, what his name was. Oh, I'm sorry. His name was Arthur Lowell Chitwood, okay. and he was... Uh, and we need to back up before we go much further because we need to go back to Oklahoma City. Oh, gosh, yes. Oh, well, yeah. Because, see, I was trying to ex explain to her, I think, why yeah. I ended up in Illinois. Yeah. Okay, in Oklahoma City, now, you have to remember, originally I went there because uh, my mom's, Help. my dad left home. So 
Uh, <clears throat> and you took the train from Oklahoma City to Perry? Every, yes, every, every, every weekend. <laughs> you couldn't do that today, I don't guess. I don't, I don't really know. If, a train, if there's a passenger train that does that. It was, uh, it was one of those trains that made... See, I just, I knew that Perry had a depot and that the train would stop at the depot. And uh, because it was just one of those regular routes, it, it might have been a Santa Fe or something. And I had been on a train a few times when I was younger. This is how I would get to my aunt's place sometimes when she would take care of me for a couple weeks. And uh, it was, I probably had to walk uh, 10 blocks or more to get to where my mom was living at the time. But all I took with me was the clothes I was wearing and I, I had a, a little white round case it, it had held a hair dryer with you know this is when you had to put the big old thing over your head and then you and then you it had a hose run in front of it and that's how you dried your hair and got your hair girl anyway I just used that and I put uh, whatever change of clothes I don't even remember what I took it wasn't a whole lot but I knew I was going home and I didn't care and uh, I usually didn't do anything other than go get her some groceries or something because uh, one of my brothers always had some kind of car there. Like I said, I never had a car the whole time I was working. <laughs> well, what was your job in Oklahoma City? Was it still doing fingerprints? Uh, no. When I went to Oklahoma City, there was no need for anything like that. I was what you would call an administrative clerk. And uh, they had these big metal drums with little sliding doors on them that held... Uh, file folders upright and these were all the reports on, on cases that the agents worked on and uh, they would ask you for certain things and they all had a little classification system on how you would find them and uh, and uh, you were also the one who when they were done with things they would give them to you and you would put them in the proper place so they could be found again because uh, uh, cases that were active they had it looked like a library with all these uh, stacks that these files were kept on and that's ones that they were doing something with at the time but if uh, if there's something they thought was finished or whatever they were kept in these drums and uh, for storage and you just it was kind of like sitting at a round desk <laughs> anyway and they also had what they called an indices which was a uh, uh, file cabinets that would look like our fish room and it was nothing but cards in it with uh, the names, addresses, and notes from the agents that would tell you uh, names of people that were in these reports that they were did. And sometimes they'd want you to pull those because of some kind of information that was on them. Either that, they, the, the name would be attached to something, you'd know where to find it in a file. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so it was a, a lot of metal cabinets big round turn turnstiles and uh, there was a a, a a supervisor and an assistant supervisor and in Oklahoma City now uh, this this is still in Oklahoma City I can tell you this because it happened again I worked with the assistant in in uh, this field office her name was KLCH no relation at all and she pronounced it cook I think but while I was in Washington, D.C., there was a young man I worked with. As he was a fingerprint expert also. His name was K-O-C-H, but he pronounced his name Cook. Isn't that funny? Three of us and no, no relation at all. On three different occasions, three different places. Mm. Isn't that something? Mm. I just thought it was <laughs> wild. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was a really nice office. Uh, well, heck, Oklahomans are all friendly. We got along really well. And uh, the, the agents, uh, I don't remember how many agents we actually had there, but they, they were in an entirely, it was all in the same building, and it was, I don't even remember where it was in Oklahoma City. It was somewhere in the area, not too far from Posse Old Drive or Circle or something. See, I don't know much about Oklahoma City. Like I said, I never had a car, so I couldn't go anywhere. I always rode the bus home. Or, or I, now, when I was living there, let's see, uh, yeah, this is Oklahoma City. Nineteen sixties, two, three, something like that. Yeah, uh, I was. Yeah, I was there. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute when I left. But anyway, because that because I went to Illinois. Yeah. Okay. 
I do some back back and forth stuff because they're they're similar places. I have to stop thinking now. Which place was I at when I did this? <laughs> but anyway, in Oklahoma City, uh, see, I'm trying. I'm I'm forgetting which was where. But I was a radio dispatcher in one of these places. That was in that was in Illinois. So scratch that. We won't talk about that right now. But in Oklahoma City, I was just an administrative clerk, and uh, I think I did occasionally help answer the phone or something, and. Uh, but while I was in Oklahoma City, uh, you know, I was born on November the 23rd, November the 22nd, uh, Kennedy was assassinated. Well, I happened to be out with the girls I work with. They had taken me out for to eat somewhere for my birthday. And, as a matter of fact, it was at the Cattleman's. Pretty fancy place Pretty for me. Fancy, yeah. but, uh, but you know what? I got it. it really wasn't that fancy a place. <laughs> I guess it was because the food was good. <laughs> anyway, uh, when I got home, my roommate said, you have a message. You are to call your office immediately when you get here. I said, oh, shoot. Well, see, I knew that. Well, let me backtrack a minute. Uh, when I found out that Kennedy was assassinated, I was at work, and I was, I was in the break area. And they have a radio that plays music, and it must have been a radio station because obviously we, it, it's, I, it seems like I remember hearing, you know, that something had happened. Of course, everybody had different sources of getting news and stuff anyway, so well, however I heard it, I just knew that uh, Kennedy had been shot, and uh, I had no way of. It never even entered my mind that it would affect me in any way other than just what had happened. But while, when I got back, when I was in that restaurant, it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. In other words, this was a happy occasion, me celebrating my birthday, but it was so quiet and so somber. We just ate our meal and just talked. I, I, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, fun. <laughs> anyway, so when I got back to where I was living, my roommate gave me that message to call. And they said, pack your bags. We have your tickets at the air airport. You're going to Dallas. I thought, oh, shoot. That night? That night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, so I had to call my mom and tell her, I said, Mom, you know, I was going home every weekend. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to be coming home. I said, I'm going to have to go to Dallas. I didn't know how long I was going to be there. But I still had my brothers were there, so it wasn't. In other words, they weren't little anymore, so I just told her, I says, I'm leaving. So, and uh, I packed my bags. And, and you know, I'm not one of these people, I, I don't have a whole, I never had a whole lot of clothes because I'm just not a clothes person. So I didn't have too much trouble picking what I was going to take. And uh, I don't even remember if I had one suitcase or two. It might have probably just been one in an overnight case. And uh, I was trying to think how I got I don't remember how I got to the airport. It must have been a taxi. Because uh, anyway, when I got there, there was another girl. I, there was one other person. That, she was a uh, uh, more of a typist. And uh, we got on the same plane. And when we landed at Dallas, uh, I don't remember anything about the weather. It must not have been any bad weather at that time. <clears throat> uh, we were met at the airport by agents who took us to uh, some middle, I guess it was, they took us to where we were going to be staying. It was some kind of hotel, but this was in an older part of Dallas. It wasn't nothing fancy about it at all. And of course, I, I didn't know anything about the area. I, I don't think I'd ever been there. And, uh, and I only had one roommate. And uh, I was trying to think, it's been long enough <laughs> put out of my mind a lot of the little details like I don't remember how I got to where we were working because it was it was very you wouldn't know what it was if you went to it it, it was just another building and you went inside and this was kind of funny <laughs> when we got to the door of the place we were supposed to go into with all these other people from the FBI the agent didn't have a way to get in the door it was locked <laughs> He used a credit card to open the dumb door. 
this is where they were going to be staying and doing their work and stuff. I thought, well, that's real bright. You could get into, well, anybody had a credit card could get in that door where we were. <laughs> just sort of amazed me. <laughs> anyway, you have to see, I wasn't, I was young, but I was, had been working a while. I just thought that was kind of odd. But anyway, we just all had this common room and, um, I don't remember a whole lot about it except, like I said, it, I just remember it being very plain and very plain. <laughs> just like a little brown building with n nothing fancy in it, no decorations, nothing. It, it was probably just a room they found that was available and it was close to where they needed to be. Because I don't really know where the FBI field office was. Well, I wasn't in that. It, this was just a building they were using. And, uh, uh, as far as what I was doing, it was, you know, those indice cards I was talking about. But pretty much what I was doing was typing those little dudes up. <laughs> Boring! <laughs> but while uh, uh, they did gather us all together in some room, and uh, they showed us the, the video uh, that had been taken by somebody of Kennedy being shot, mm. and uh, told us what we were going to be doing, and they, uh, they and they obviously didn't know how long we were going to be there either and uh, just told us what we were going to be doing and you just went back and forth every day from your room we didn't go anywhere there might have been a couple of times when my roommate and I shoot we were given a per diem to buy food they didn't tell you where to go to get it we had to just hunt around to find a place to eat and uh, we didn't have a car of course, we didn't have nothing. I don't. We were just small town kids. <laughs> I wouldn't have known to, where if I got in a taxi. What am I going to tell him? Where, where am I going to tell him I'm going? I don't know where I'm going. I'm looking for a place to eat. We did find some area where they had a, a, a movie theater, so we did go to the movies a couple times. Oh, I was only there a month, mm. and uh, there were uh, a lot of the typists were there for six months, but I was only there from. Uh, the November the 23rd through uh, I think it was like December the 23rd somewhere in there that and because of this per diem I wasn't spending it on food we were just eating a lot of times we were just carrying crackers around in our in our pockets from where we had ate <laughs> that was what we snacked on and uh, there must have been some kind of little cafe like it wasn't a big fancy restaurant or nothing that we could eat at and uh, we didn't go now, I'll admit, just when we found out when we were going home, we, I did some shopping and I bought some really nice Christmas presents. But then I had to get them home. So I had, I don't remember how. I must have had two some cases. <laughs> but I, my family had a nice Christmas that year. Mm -hmm. And I'll get, I had another little story to tell about that too. Um, it, we were, it, we were really worried about getting home because of the day they were going, they decided they were going to send us they had a horrible snowstorm in Dallas and uh, they finally decided you know I don't remember how I got to the airport but we did get there and the plane did take off and, uh, it, and it made it to Oklahoma City and there was no one there to meet me I know I I, I don't remember how I got home <clears throat> I don't remember how I got home anyway I made it and uh, I, when I walked in the door to where my my mom and, and my brothers were living and my sister, as a matter of fact, I think I had one brother at home, Charles, and then my youngest brother and my sister were there. My oldest brother, he was married and uh, I think he might have, he was still in Washington, D.C. or he lived in Arlington, Virginia or somewhere. But anyway, he had been to the service and when he came back, he got they always give you your job back if you have to leave like that mm -hmm. and he came back instead of being a fingerprint expert he got they uh gave him the job working in a uh, crypto analysis so he didn't talk about that much <laughs> but anyway so my brother was still in the fbi but uh i'm getting lost i'm lost here i forgot what i was going to tell you before i said that i try to pinpoint where i'm at and where everybody else is oh yeah i'm walking in the door to my house there's a Christmas tree sitting there. Now, our house was, like I said, it was a rental house. And we never had any pretty furniture or nothing. But there was a Christmas tree sitting there, and there was gifts under the tree wrapped. There was a dog. 
three legs worked. One of them had something wrong with it. It might have been broken at one time and never, never got fixed, but he was probably a stray. I don't know, but he was living at this house with my folks, and it had chewed big chunks out of the arm of the couch. There was no one there when I got there. I don't know where they were, but my mom wasn't even there. <laughs> it was a sick dog. And uh, it had torn up a bunch of the Christmas presents. And it made me so mad. I took that dog to the animal shelter and I told him I don't want to see it again. I wasn't very nice of me and I wasn't being very humane. <laughs> But we didn't have anything, but what we did have, that dog had destroyed it. I don't remember if he did anything else in the house, but they just, I, could, I can't remember where my family was when I got home. Because I had to, it's like I didn't come straight to my house on a car. Somehow or another, I either ended up on a bus or on a train again to get home. Because, like I said, there was no one there to welcome me. <laughs> but we had a grand time that Christmas. <laughs> I remember I bought my two, two of my brothers these big, heavy wool, black wool coats. You know, the kind that was came down the past your calves. And, and black felt hats. And uh, I probably bought them something else to go with it. How in the world I got this stuff home, I have no idea. I must have been loaded on there. <laughs> anyway. And I, I don't remember what I bought either. I just remember them because I, I have a picture of them going. I wanted to take a picture of them as they were going in or out of the door. And I can I can still see it in my head with them wearing them. And, and so proud of those outfits because they never had anything like that. And they looked really nice. Like I said, that was a, that I had more fun that Christmas because that, that's what gives me the greatest joy of anything I ever, I've ever done is I, I love being able to do stuff for somebody like that because I was so privileged that we had enough relatives that did stuff for us all the time. When I had the opportunity, I would go hog wild and enjoy it every minute of it. You know, I don't remember if I bought myself anything. <laughs> I probably didn't. Anyway, oh, anyway. I just wanted you to know that I do like doing stuff like that. And not for trying to get anything out of it, just that's, who cares? If you want to do it, do it. Well, during that time, did you get to see the funeral? Or you weren't in the gone to oh, D.C. No. for you no. just watch no. it on TV like everybody, oh, like yes. you know, else? Oh, you know how when we had the bombing in Oklahoma City, just nonstop TV. Of course, your TV screen was a little smaller, and it was black and white and not that clear. But I, I can remember that's all you saw and heard. It was never off. It was on all the time, just like it was uh, in, in, in Oklahoma. And uh, I, can, I remember... I was actually watching TV when Oswald was shot by Jack Ruby because he was right there on TV. They were leaving from some, I can't remember if they was going or coming, but I remember seeing that arm of, of Jack Ruby shooting Oswald and, and thinking, oh my gosh. But uh, I was, like I said, I was just clerical and uh, that was our, our source of news. We didn't, I don't think we even ever saw a newspaper. We didn't buy a newspaper. and. Uh, it was just, you did your job and the agents did theirs and you didn't really talk about that much. Mm. I mean, there was no trying to figure out who did what. I can remember, I didn't tell you that when, when I did come to Dallas and I said we were met by the agents, the agents took us all out to eat. I don't know where this place was. It might have been another, uh, what do I call that place? The Cat Cattleman. Cattleman's, but it was in Dallas, Texas. And uh, see this. See how I, my mind works. All of a sudden, I think, oh, I remember there was something that was really special to me. Those agents took us, and of course, we didn't have to pay for it. I'm sure they used per diem and whatever. But anyway, but I'd never been in a place. Of course, it was a lot fancier than what we had in Oklahoma City. And I just remember the appetizer was one rib about that long. And it had something poured over it, and there was wine somewhere and all. Oh, they had little, uh, I don't know if it was ice cream or sherbet or what, but it had wine poured over it. Red wine. <laughs> and I think we had, I had steak. I just remember, I thought, wow. <laughs> little old me with all these big old agents and uh, 
and and one thing that I remember from this is that one of those agents, he could have been the spitting image of Connolly. I mean, he had the gray hair. He even looked like him. And I thought, man. <laughs> but I'm rubbing shoulders. See, we I worked for the FBI, and I was around agents all the time. But they were, they were just the guys I worked with. But these, I came to a special place. These were people I didn't know, and they were treating us like, like we were kings and queens. And I thought, wow. So, I was impressed. Soak it all up. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> of course, that was the only time we ate like that, but that was nice they did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, well. You know, when I, I've told this story to a lot of people, but I, I, there's certain parts I always left, leave out if I think it's going to be uh, heard uh, too, by too many people because uh, uh, we, 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 we did something that wasn't probably protocol. <laughs> but when we're off camera, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> Wasn't nothing illegal. Just a, uh, anyway. In other words, I was out and about, and it was a big town. And I was a small town girl. This is all new to me. So I was impressed. But uh, like I said, when we got when we did got into the working mode, we were in the working mode. There was no messing around. And uh, we were all in the same boat. We all knew what was going on, so there wasn't a whole lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, that TV was on all the time, and that's all you saw. Just, it was like, oh, and I remember the case on. Is that what you call the, the that carried the, the body? Uh, I'll never forget seeing that on TV and the sound of those drums. There was some kind of drums, it was just some kind of beat and the, and the click clopping of the horse's hooves mm -hmm. and that boot facing the wrong direction. Wasn't there a boot facing the wrong, wrong direction? Mm -hmm. Anyway, there was a boot that had some significance and it was on a riderless horse. And uh, I, I just, it was so solemn, I'll never forget that. And you know, it's, it's you see pictures in magazines, Life Magazine, all these pictures of Little John and his little slutin. Well, I didn't see just the pictures. I saw it happening on TV in real life. <laughs> it was very impressive. Yeah. It was really something to be able to... I was there. And uh, I was just a small fry in a big pot, big pan. <laughs> From Perry, Oklahoma. Yeah. I mean, and I've written uh, several little write-ups, and I gave one of them to you, I think, of uh, the way it was. But there was a lot of things that we did that were so mundane and uh, nothing exciting about it. Uh, it. Writing about it was a lot more interesting than actually doing it. <laughs> now, anyway, but it is a story to tell that not many people can tell. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that my kids are even impressed because they've heard it too often. <laughs> Grandchildren, then. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, the first thing John tells everybody when they started work for us, he would tell them, she worked for the FBI and she went to Dallas. Yes, I, I think I remember him telling me that. Yeah, it was, I thought, well, I, it wasn't anything. I wasn't special. I was just there, and I was needed to do mundane clerical stuff. But I had a story to tell just from being there. In a historical spot. You yes. got it. I, I, I helped make history. You did. At least my family's history. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> yeah, so let, let's, let's fast forward then. How, when did you come back to Oklahoma from Springfield? <sighs> oh, oh, okay. This was after I was married. I told you I met my husband on a blind date. Mm -hmm. And I only knew him. That was in June. And uh, December the 9th, we were married. That same year? Same year. Well, shoot, at our age. <laughs> How old were you? Well, well, I was 29 when I got married. Okay. That's old enough for... Yeah, that's old enough. For, I know, I, like I said, I'd only needed, dated a couple of people. And, How did he ask, the, ask you? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. On my second date with him, he asked me, to, he said he wanted to marry me then. He knew instantly. He said, "This is the late. This is the woman I want to marry." Well, needless to say, I wasn't convinced. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> oh well. 
he was likable enough, and we got along, and, and uh, we shared a lot of the same interests. Like, he was, his dad was very handy with tools and woodwork and stuff, and uh, Arthur took, uh, he could do anything his dad did, and sometimes even do it better. And, and uh, what's funny is I could do anything his mother could do, because she was crafty in, in the toll painting and all this stuff. So... Uh, we shared a lot of the same interest, and uh, he was uh, in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and like I said, we got along, and uh, we'd only been married. We got married in December, and uh, Carrie was born in December. My my son, he was born on December the fifth, and our wedding anniversary was the ninth. <laughs> and uh, and then Missy didn't come along until uh, seventy one. Yeah. When did you move back okay. to Oklahoma? All right. Before, we, uh, before when we got married, we lived in a little rental place to start out with. But then we moved. He worked at a power plant, and uh, it was uh, I think like twenty some miles or seventeen. No, I'm forgetting. Um, the power plant was uh, like thirty miles or whatever from Springfield, Illinois, and the house we lived at was about half that distance. And uh, but the power plant was only three miles from this town called Pawnee, so there was a Pawnee, Illinois, and a Pawnee, Oklahoma, and uh, we found us a home. And uh, I'm trying to think for a down payment. I had some savings bonds I'd saved, and that was what I used to make my down payment on our house. And uh, it was in the country, and there was a big soil field. It was. There was maybe three houses, and we weren't even next to each other, and then the rest of the houses were at the other end of the, the addition. And it was just a straight line with one road, and it was a dirt road. It hadn't even been uh, concrete or whatever they did to them or blacktop. But there was this huge, uh, uh, I don't know how many acres it was. It was like a city block of soybeans. So it was green all the time. And then there was houses all the way around it on every side. And... Uh, and it was in the the, country, the outskirts of the suburbs of town. And, and Pawnee was about the same size as the Pawnee, Oklahoma. It wasn't a big place. It had a, it was just an old town, but it was only three miles from where my husband worked at the power plant. So that was really neat. And he'd get home at 4.30 in the afternoon to expect supper at 4.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> so I learned to live with it. <laughs> that was kind of early. So anyway, but... uh. I didn't, I didn't do anything. I was uh, trying to think. I quit work when Carrie was born. Uh, well, maybe a few months old when I quit. And uh, I thought... So you had about 10 years in with Yeah, the I had about 10 years worth of FBI. And uh, I decided I, was, I would stay at home with my child. And uh, that was the main reason why we bought that house, was so we, we could raise a family. And uh, they had a... a they built a church that I we we used to have to go nine, nine miles to the Christian church I went to, but uh, they uh, wasn't very long after we moved there, the town of Pawnee built an independent Christian church like I'm used to going to, and uh, I think my husband and I even helped with some of the stuff that they did to that church because we were I was always really involved in anything that had to do with it. In other words, I did a lot of stuff. I was Sunday school teacher, vacationed. You know, and anything artistic that had been done, I did it. So when my kids started school, and because they were, we were in, uh, when did I leave? <laughs> well, anyway, my kids started school. They were in the grade school in Pawnee, Illinois. And uh, I uh, got involved in PTA. <laughs> and uh, I did lots of poster work for them, announcing things and all. And, and that's how I started learning to use my abilities uh, I don't know how they found out, <laughs> but they did. I guess there was an, it was a small town, and a lot of people that I went to church with also had kids in school and all, so they knew the, the kind of things I could do. And uh, and my husband, he, he worked shift work, so uh, and his folks were from were living in Metropolis, Illinois, and uh, when we had went uh, before we moved to Oklahoma, we went to see them about every maybe every five weeks.
because with his shift work and all, he had, he had one long period where he'd had several days off, not just two days off. Mm -hmm. But anyway, see, I, I, I've moved around enough. I have to stop and think where I'm at when I'm talking about it. So I'm in Pawnee now. <laughs> this is Pawnee, Illinois. That's right. That's why I'm talking about his folks in Metropolis. But anyway, uh, I had no family there in the area, but there are enough uh, cousins and whatever would do some traveling and it, I can remember two or three occasions when somebody actually came to my house that was from my home town <laughs> or not not necessarily my hometown but from Oklahoma so but I was pretty well you pretty much your family was of the people you went to church and school with and mm -hmm. and uh, I think I uh, was a member of some women's club that did stuff together too anyway I didn't just sit on my duff I just I like to be doing something, and uh, and uh, we had, I did a lot. My husband, like I said, he was good at uh, woodwork and stuff. I remember we built us a fence uh, out of wood, and it was just those uh, what are six-inch panels or whatever you call them, and they they were stacked like this so that you could see through, depending on which way you were standing, but you couldn't look right at it and see through. So it was still private, but it would let air through. And a nice green yard, and while we were there, we built a double, a two and a half car garage. Me and Arthur. The only thing that had to be done was the cement laid. And uh, I think somebody put the rafters on top, and everything else we did it ourselves. And he had a workshop in there, and that's where he did his little crafty stuff. And we would go to, uh, uh, I don't remember where they, they were, probably at fairgrounds and stuff. But, we made stuff and then we would sell it mm. and uh, I, I've always done that yeah. eventually I quit because it got to be where it wasn't fun anymore it was a chore because <laughs> you were making multiple things of the same thing and they got kind of old mm. <laughs> anyway. what you liked in math you picked up yeah. in, in art huh? well I was one of them people who I could look at something and uh and make it. I mean, no one taught me how to do anything I was doing. It's just, I just knew how. And uh, I did it. And Arthur, all, all he had to do was, I'd draw the patterns and he would cut stuff out for me out of the wood and all, and uh, stain it and whatever he had to do, and then I would paint on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't always just stuff he'd cut out. We used, it was a lot of primitives, a lot of the, you know, a lot back, back when I was doing stuff, you had skillets and pans and stuff, and you, you spray painted them black and painted on them. And those were primitives. And then, uh, or I had lots of old doors with door panels. And uh, that, that was one of the fun things I liked to paint on because they were a nice size and they were nice looking. They already had a shape to them that you didn't do anything to except sand them a little and then paint on them. And, uh, I don't, I, I might only have a couple of things of all the things I ever made and painted. I only have three things, I think. And uh, we sold all the rest of it. <laughs> and we even made, we made, for a while, we made barn board furniture. And I have one thing that we made, and it's a boot, I call it a boot bench. It's just a, it's about the size, a little bit bigger than that gray thing. And it's all barn board, and it has a, a, a tall back and like an armchair side and the seat doesn't lift up but we, we made something I think that, would, that you could use it as a storage place anyway we did a lot of stuff did you do that when you were here in Oklahoma no I was that was in Illinois, Illinois. yeah and uh, now when we came to Oklahoma I we did lots of craft work too but it, we didn't build furniture anymore because it just took a lot more space and uh, I lived out in the country, you know, on Behan Road, and we had a lot of room out there. And we, we built us a two-and-a-half car garage out there, too. And uh, that's where Arthur had, that's where he did his work. And I did most of what I was doing in the house. Um, <laughs> if somebody came into my house, they would usually see a mess. <laughs> well, what year did you move back? Was oh, it, oh was, sorry. Was it in the... In 79. Okay. My, uh... We came home to Oklahoma every year, those the 11, 11 years I lived in Illinois, and uh, he liked, he only had one sister, 
and uh, she was a lot younger than him. But I had a big family. I had three brothers and my sister and tons of cousins. I used to tell my kids when we'd go and visit us, now be careful what you say to the people you're talking to because they're probably a cousin. <laughs> and we're able to get back. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Nobody kicked us out of town. But uh, it's really neat. Uh, I was born and raised in Perry and, uh, and uh, lots and lots of cousins. And uh, I'd say we're pretty close knit because. Uh, they, we still have get-togethers where, where we'll meet and have like a reunion, you know, family reunion. Not as often as we used to. Uh, and I don't recognize them anymore because I've changed too much. <laughs> some, some of, there's a few of it, you know, they, they're, they didn't change that much. But, like, I have one cousin that I would recognize his voice anywhere. It's just a different kind of voice. But I had a lot of good-looking cousins. I really did. And uh, like I said, my mom was one of ten, and you know, there's only one aunt left, and she's really old. So my family is gone, and, and you know, it's 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 kind of scary. It makes you know that I'm getting old. But you appreciate all that too. Oh sure. yes, I mean, a family is a wonderful thing to have. I feel sorry for anybody that hadn't got one, because uh, we had our problems occasionally, but especially. Uh, my mom and dad got divorced. But she had a big family to help her out, and uh, so it wasn't like we were isolated or anything. We always had somebody we could talk to and know what was going on. They were glad you moved back. Oh, I'm sure they were. I, I know my mom was. <laughs> I was glad to be back. That was a long time to live somewhere where my only family was my husband's family. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and he was raised a lot different. His mom and dad, uh, I would say they were well off simply because his, his dad had a really good job and he worked at a power plant too. And uh, So you moved back to Perkins, not Perry, Perkins. Uh, well, I, I, I had a Perkins address because of where I lived on Meehan Road. A couple of miles north and I would have been a Stillwater in Stillwater. Okay. Yeah. So my kids went to Perkins School. Both of them did and graduated there. And uh, well, how did you come to work in the library? Oh. <laughs> well, there's a few years after you. I mean, if you moved in 79, yeah. it was a, oh, four or five now, years. Now, for a long before. time, I didn't work. But when my kids were like 12, 13, somewhere in there, uh, it, was, it was costing more to keep them clothed and fed. So, uh, and my husband had a really good job, but uh, it just cost more to live. I had a neighbor that lived in the, uh, just, uh, there was a, uh, course, uh, because I was in the country, they were my next door neighbors, but there was, there was a, a room for maybe a couple of houses between us that was just land, but uh, they were a, an older couple, and we, they had, ca they had uh, cattle. And you know when, I, when uh, we eventually got some cattle ourselves, we had some Black Angus cattle. With the whole idea that we were going to eat, we knew we were going to eat them. But uh, when they were, <laughs> but my uh, son got to show some of them in for 4-H or FFA. And then uh, we had uh, pigs, a few pigs that my son and daughter showed, and uh, none of them were prize-winning animals, but they learned a lot by uh, having them. And so did I. As a matter of fact, I, 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 if I was, we had one uh, steer we called Murdoch. If you remember their TV show, Murdoch was the crazy one. <laughs> well, Murdoch was the crazy one. He didn't have anything to do. He had his own mind, and he wouldn't. He wasn't very cooperative. So if they, we needed to do something, he would let me walk up to him. But anybody else, he wouldn't let him have anything to do with him. He just. He let he would let me get within close enough just that I could grab his halter or whatever. But he was he ran away from home one time, and uh, some of my uh, son's schoolmates got in a pickup and they knew where he was going. But that steer Murdoch ran and threw all the pastures in a straight path to Perkins. Now I lived. I think it was 10 miles or 9 miles that somewhere in there from Perkins 
and jumping finches and all ever I mean, he's done, but the, the kids were able to keep enough, seeing him enough to know where he was going. They followed him all the way to the Cimarron River on the other side of Perkins before they caught him. And one of the one of the boys that was in the in the pickup had a rope and lassoed him. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been a sight to have it on a video? <laughs> you know, anyway, we were talking about being in the country and <laughs> and my neighbors. Okay, my neighbors. They were uh, because we had things in common like the cattle and stuff. We we we'd never had anything like that before, so they more or less told us and showed us what to do. And plus I had another neighbor live a quarter of a mile from us that was, because the kids were active, went to school together and we were in 4-H and F-A-8 together. We as a, as a, we were in a lot of uh, little events they would have so that we got to know the parents of everybody that we were around. And uh, I was told my neighbor that I was, decided I needed to find me a job and she worked in a nursing home. And uh, I decided I, the first couple of jobs I had to start out with was uh, I cleaned the church, got paid to clean the church. And then, and then there was some other building in town, like the place where the the, the city uh, leaders met, where they had their meetings and all that. I cleaned that. I thought, ah, this isn't, <laughs> isn't going to get me very far. So I... Uh, my neighbor told me that there was a, a job opening in the Stillwater Nursing Home. And I thought, well, I was always real active with church work and help and doing things with people in the church. And uh, a, a lot of them were the older people. And I thought, I could probably, I didn't have any training. And they were pretty desperate for help. So I interviewed for the job. And my, jo my job, what I did was actually three jobs. <laughs> and, uh, like I said, they probably should never have hired me because I didn't have, I wasn't trained on how to handle somebody who's in a nursing home and a lot of them, you know, were bed fast or pretty much that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were just, it, be, it was like helping your grandparents out or whatever had, you had to do. And they, of course they had the nurses and all. I didn't have to worry about their health or anything. But I was the one who was supposed to keep them active. So I had to plan things to get them moving around and little activities where, like I said, this is something a physical therapist was, should have been doing of some time. But they had enough stuff there, someone would tell me what other people had done and I may not have done it right, but I had them moving around <laughs> and, you know, using their hands and walking and and just not being, just sitting and, or laying down. And I also had to uh, entertain them so, in other words, you know, like it was like teaching vacation Bible school. You just had them doing these little projects where they were using their mind and, and doing stuff where they were uh, creating things. And who knows what they did with all this stuff. And, <laughs> and, uh, and also, it's, uh, I directed a lot of activities in the, in the nurse home itself. And I would, had to make a calendar of, every, of, of the things that were going on every day. And they had to have something every day that they were doing so I worked there six months I said they don't pay me enough to do all this and besides that I knew that I wasn't really trained for all this kind of stuff even though I did it okay they were glad to have me uh, but I I, uh, I just got to think about the different places I might go to look for work and I honestly don't know I guess it was just the idea that it was OSU and I like books. I just decided to see if there was a job that I could find in the library, but I don't remember any kind of advertisement. I honestly don't remember what led me to John. But uh, my son was one of these people who had a lot of friends, and our phone was busy all the time. And this particular evening, the phone had been ringing off the hook, and my phone was in the kitchen, which was where I was most of the time. And I was the one who was answering the phone. And it, it rang enough times, and I'd answered it enough times for my son that the, I, I'd reached the limit. Of, I thought, okay, I answered the phone, and I said, Carrie's answering service, it was John. 
on. <laughs> and he was calling to tell me he wanted me to come in for an appointment. So I met him and Vicki. Uh, it was snowy weather. I just remember there was snow on the ground. It was really cold. And it must have been on a, they must have picked a Saturday to, for me, because I don't remember anybody being around other than them. And because I remember Vicki was sitting on a desk or something, and I don't know, John, John was just standing there, I guess, but I just thought that was really, I had this, this adult businesswoman just hopped up on a desk and sat down and sw swinging her legs and stuff. I thought, and they're interviewing me? <laughs> but anyway, I had uh, brought samples of some of the things that I did at the nursing home so they could see that I had good handwriting. And uh, because I had to make these little calendars and it was all done by hand, you know, making little squares, all that stuff. And, uh, and I did it all in ink. And, uh, I th and, and plus the, the application form I filled out, I did it all in ink and printed it. So it, he liked the fact that I had good handwriting and appeared to be organized, and then that I was a uh, dependable, probably, person because I worked for the FBI. <laughs> and uh, his, the, his main interest was to hire somebody who would be there longer than two years. Well, I said, well, I thought, yeah, I could probably be there for two years. Heck, I was there 31 years. And, you know, I worked in that department. Now, we moved around a lot because of different things taking place in the libraries. Uh, uh, asbestos abatement and different things that were going on, but John, Vicki was the boss when I got there, and it wasn't that much longer when they decided they didn't want husband and wives working in the same department. They would let them work in the same building, but they wouldn't let them work together. So Vicki went down to, uh, the, I think it was, might have been physical sciences or whatever it was called then on the first floor, and. Uh, and then John remained, he had been her assistant. So now he was the boss. And I worked for them, or John, the entire time in the same department, the whole time I was there. I just, you know, I stopped and think about that, you know, 31 years with the same boss. And John, he, the atmosphere in our department, to me, was always, it was like a big family. And that's the way John treated us. He was the boss and he told you what to do and, uh, but he also treated you like family, as far as every year, you know, giving us, uh, having those Christmas, uh, well, Christmas time uh, dinners at his house where him and Vicki cooked like, it was like two people cooking a whole Thanksgiving meal for, oh, uh, what, 20 people sometimes be there? A lot of people. And, uh, and besides feeding us, he would give everybody a little gift. Wasn't, wasn't anything fancy, but he would, he would wrap something up and we all got a gift. It was, it was really nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to be, I don't know how I managed it. I, I'm just one of these people who always took a lot of pictures and I think it, the idea was I took pictures while I had the opportunity because I was away from home for so much and that's all I had was pictures to look at to make me close to my family. So everywhere I ever went, I took pictures. So I got to be the person that every time, everything that happened in our office that was of some importance or something unusual and all of John's parties that he gave, I took pictures. So uh, when he retired, I forgot how many albums he had, but it filled a whole top shelf and maybe even part of another shelf. And plus he had a little box of things he hadn't even gotten in there yet. But it was, and I, from 1984, November 1984 until uh, the day he retired, I was still taking pictures for him. And uh, he's got a ton of pictures. And you're not in very many of not them. Not many of them, that's the truth. So I, but I did get to where every now and then I'd hand some, there might be one picture at, at his Christmas parties or something because I would hand the camera to somebody, would you please take my picture so they'll know I was here. <laughs> But I just, I just got to where I, I took pictures of everything. It, and it didn't have to be our department. After I got in the library, I was taking them everywhere. <laughs> what, what was your job initially? Uh, what did you Oh, gosh. When I, when I, when I first came to work, uh, the uh, office has always been in the same area, but we didn't have uh, uh, CML 
had an area at the at the end of the hallway, and they also had, there was a school room, a classroom, hooked on to the area that the government documents department is now. And I done, we had the fish room, which was a separate room. I don't remember the. I think the center part of our office and the back part of our office was what was the classroom. All we had was that main area in the front and back-to-back desks, those old gray metal desks. And uh, they were put together so that you were, each person was facing each other. And I swear, that all the room between those desks, wherever they were located, you could get a cart through pushing it. You weren't beside it. You were pushing it or pulling it. It was packed. Mm. And until that classroom, I don't know when it, I don't even remember what year it was that, it, that they were just gone and weren't there anymore and they let us have that area. It was crowded. And there was a lot, oh, I can remember uh, picturing when, when we got, com when we started out, there was one computer in the office. And it, it still, they still had a little tape player, a tape player with a cassette in it and uh and that what you call it oh it was a cassette player anyway but with instructions that went with the video you were watching on the computer that told you how to operate and do things mm. well heck i never even i never I never even saw a computer it was all new to me so i had, I had that was something new to me but uh the, the, the actual job I had when I started work there was because they didn't know what I was going to do yet, I don't guess, was uh, fish. <laughs> One of the worst things in the world for anybody's eyesight, and all I was doing was counting them, make sure they were all there. <laughs> you talk about, I'm sitting here thinking, is this all I'm going to do all day, every day? So, but then, uh, the, uh, you know, I don't. Of all, I, I get kind of, I get to thinking about some of the stuff I did for the FBI because it was similar type mm -hmm. stuff. But I, it seems like I was did something with uh, files, and uh, um, <laughs> see, I don't really remember. It was just clerical type stuff, and uh, you. Uh, Oh, I don't remember. You know, I think the reason it's confusing is because we didn't have the computers to work on. Everything we did was by hand. Mm -hmm. We had a form that we would catalog. That's what it was. We had a form that we'd fill out with certain types of information on all of them for the books that we got in. And uh, that's primarily what I was doing was cataloging. I even classified. You know, cler clerks didn't classify then. It was just the librarians. Well, they, they were... I don't remember how many people were actually, it seemed like it was wall-to-wall -wall librarians, but <laughs> at one time, I can remember the back wall after we did computers, get computers, that, that one back area on the, you know, we had that little thing in the corner with one computer. We had, the whole wall was computers. We had like 15 students working for us, and there was almost always somebody sitting at those computers that were lined up along the wall. And they weren't anywhere else. You didn't have any on your desk or anything. And I don't. We, we sure didn't have that copier in there. That was out in the library somewhere. And uh, yeah, it was it was it was paper cataloging is what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, John, I don't know why, but he 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 showed me how to classify and. He said I was better than the librarians at classifying. <laughs> Maybe it was because it was new to me and I did exactly as I was told and didn't didn't have anything to compare it to or anything. So and uh, eventually I didn't do the classifying anymore because he got more librarians and <laughs> they got better trained or something. <laughs> so I was just clear. Everything I did was strictly clerical, and, but uh, but I became involved in some of the things that were going on in the library. and uh, Who was the dean of the library when you were hired? Was it Roscoe? Yes, Rouse? it was. It Roscoe was Roscoe Rouse. Rouse. And, uh, uh, so you've been through three deans. I, I was trying to think of his name. <laughs> Dr. Guy. Ed Johnson. Well, no, who, wasn't there, oh, maybe it was assistant boss, Mr. Nelson. 
I remember Mr. Nelson a lot, being very quiet, but he was down yeah, in the dean's office. He must think. have been the assistant. Mm -hmm. But I really liked Dean Johnson, or Edward Johnson. We got along. I don't know why, because we you got like along. Fish. Yeah, that, that's we why. got we got yeah. <laughs> we got along really well. I don't know if we were close to the same age or what it was. Uh, maybe he just reminded me of somebody. You know, he. I just thought he was, he was one of those people who got involved and you saw him everywhere. I mean, he wandered the floors. I can picture him walking past the windows, checking, you know, how the blinds were and all that kind of stuff. And he would walk into the office. You never knew when he was coming because he would just appear. But he was, he walked the floors and mixed with the departments and you got to know him. And... I, as best I could tell you, he's probably the only one who ever did it the way he probably should have done it. And uh, very personable. Yeah, he was. And uh, but anyway, I never had any trouble getting along with him and, and uh, doing stuff for him. And he was the one who uh, he found out what I was doing for John as far as trying to make displays and stuff because somebody else was using those display cases and the light and. I think it was Suzanne, when I came there, was supposed to be doing a display on the United Nations. And when I first came there, we didn't have the wall, well, I didn't, we didn't have, were able to use the wall cases. We had a, a, uh, a standing glass display case that was, a, uh, it was only like this wide, and it had two big old pieces of glass that you had to push back and forth so that you couldn't get to, you had to reach around that other piece of glass to get anything in there. It was hard to work with, and it, it was it, you couldn't make interesting displays much because all you had was you could see what was behind the glass. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, it was all glass. But anyway, they eventually took that away, and there was a time period there where I didn't do any displays simply because they took that. It belonged to somebody else, historical, something in history or something took it back. And so I didn't have a place. And then uh, when Dr. Johnson got to be the head of the library, or the director, and he knew what I had done, he was the one who said he was going to give me those display cases, or uh, the wall cases, uh, on that one end. I, I did many times do something in both of them because, because nobody was using them for anything. And... Uh, but that one area became my documents, only documents department displays. In other words, John, want, there were a lot of people, they would come up to the fifth floor and the first thing they would say was, I've never been up here before. They didn't even know what we had. And John says, we need to be able to publicize what the government documents is and what we have and what's available and how to use it. So he said, my job was going to be to fill that display case. Uh, I don't remember. I filled it more often at the beginning than I did later. I, I only kept things there, maybe. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> but it was uh, never more than a, uh, I don't think I kept anything more than a month. I might have even had some things were up there like two months, just depending on what was going on. But uh, everything that I put in there was some kind of, it was like I'm, I'm explaining to people that when they walk by, I made sure they knew it was a government documents display in some way or manner. And everything that was in there came from our department. And my purpose was to explain what these books were and how they could be useful to the students. And uh, I'm sure there's plenty of, and there was a lot of people who watched me when I, because I was right down there in the middle of the, the hallway and the people were coming and going constantly. And a lot of times they'd stop and watch me or they would talk to me when I was trying to put it up. And here I'm all hot and sweaty and reaching in this old, you know, it gets hot in there behind the glass and this is what I'm having my head stuck in all the time. And, and I'm, because it's, it's tall, I had to stand on a stool to get a lot of that stuff. But... I, I could do anything I wanted as long as the end result was something that was uh, decent looking <laughs> and told you something that had to do with the government documents already. And once in a while I would do something that was special, but not too many times. And uh, sometimes for the holidays I would put something in the one that wasn't being used that 
season's greetings or happy holidays or something just to make it. Of course, I had to be really careful because it wasn't supposed to be anything religious, so it had to be Santa Claus. <laughs> and uh, but I, I, after I had been there a while and done a few, uh, I would do displays that was scenery, and I, I loved making those white snow-covered trees mm -hmm. with the snow on the ground and a, a black sky in the background with lots of stars but I always made one star bigger than the others <laughs> and anybody who had any smarts knew that I wasn't it wasn't just a winter scene this was Christmas time and it had a special meaning yeah, but anyway, I thought but I, nobody ever called me on it <laughs> Just so people will know, it's on the west end on the second floor beside the well, it's, and reading it's not, room yeah, now. Yeah, and it's not even there anymore. No. It's just blank wall. It's totally different. But, uh, I did it for uh, well, about 28 years. Wow. Is how long I did it. I remember watching you cut and make the eagle. Uh, the that was one of my eagle. favorite things. I started that out on a vacation where we went to see my husband's parents and I think they were living in Kentucky at the time and I took these little white cards with me and uh, I can't remember if I had some brown one, colored ones with me too I think I had cut them from some kind of heavy colored paper and uh, I started out cutting the shape of the feathers and then I would sit there while my, my mother-in-law had a tendency to talk a lot. So, oh, how nobody ever, she ever, well, she didn't like it anymore anyway. <laughs> but anyway, in other words, she didn't get it in the word edgewise. So I, 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 my husband always took off and went somewhere with his dad. And if my kids were, were with me, they were more or less with him. <laughs> but uh, this was done when I was older, so my kids weren't even anywhere around. But I, I thought, there's no way I can just sit in this chair and not be able to do anything because I wouldn't I was stuck with my mother-in-law she was a decent person but like I said she she uh, it was like I don't care what I said she would uh, tell me the same thing only it was her opinion and her opinion was always right <laughs> but anyway I would sit there and I just started I had a pair of scissors and I just started snipping and turning them into feathers you know what I mean? I didn't count how many feathers are on there. It'd be funny if somebody ever counted them. But I, <laughs> I didn't really know how it was going to look. I just know what I wanted to use. I knew I couldn't make a whole eagle, so I'll do the head. And I had seen a picture that I liked of the way it was looking in the position. And I probably spent as much time making that eye look like an eye as I did putting them feathers on there. Because I wanted to to look real and an eye is really hard to <laughs> to draw and make it look like it's a real eye if you've ever, not ever tried it mm -hmm. but I got the beak down I uh, used so I'm starting to forget what I used but I know I used brown paper grocery sacks and I don't think I used any newspaper and I just wadded it up in the shape I wanted and, and crumpled it up and laid it down and then formed the shape of it and glued it on so it looked like a beak with dimension. In other words, I didn't want anything flat. And I got it looking just right, leaving the nostril hole and the tip of the beak and all that. And uh, and I finally got that eye and I had to... It, sometimes the pictures I use aren't always really clear and, I, and it's hard to even see the detail, but. It was really hard for me getting that eyebrow over the eagle's eye because if you, you, if you was, ever had a chance to look at that eagle again, maybe in pictures, it, it literally, it has an eyebrow and those feathers go a certain direction and they're a different size. And that was really hard and it, it took a few times before I ever got it right. But then, but, but putting the feathers on, I had to do things in reverse because each layer had another layer on top of it. So that you started down here to work tough. So, but it, so it was kind of going against the current. You wanted, it was natural to want to start at the top and work down, but you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But and uh, once I got going, sometimes I'd have to make a feather a little bit smaller than the others. I mean, just trim it or something. But I had more fun making that eagle than anything I've ever done, and I was so proud of it because it was so 
official beautiful. look at it. It really beautiful. was pretty. I was. I think I used it in three different displays. Where is it now? I gave it to John when he retired. Well, I gave it to Vicky because I knew he probably wouldn't take it. <laughs> but she 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 snapped it up pretty quick. <laughs> I thought, well, how many of these are you going to see? Mm -hmm. And uh, I had no place to put it. It was too big. And that thing was like this one. But that was, I got lots of pictures of it, though. You know, I took pictures of every display I did. And uh, when I started out, they were, well, I didn't know exactly what they wanted of me. But I got braver as the more I did, <laughs> and I pretty much did anything I wanted, <laughs> as long as it looked good. But that was, it was just, I was just was, that was so lucky that I got to do something like that because it's something, I, I, I would tell everybody, I get paid for playing, because to me it was playing. And you know, for many, many years, that was 50% of my job was doing those displays. Right. It really was. Mm -hmm. And because I would take, it took a lot of time to gather the information, to decide how I wanted it to look, and then I had to make my background and whatever I was putting in it and and do all that lettering. So that, that lettering, a lot of it, I did by hand and then had to cut it out. It just, things look better when they're individual pieces than just like a, somebody slapped up a big old copy of a newspaper print or something, you know. It, it was handmade. Well, almost all of it was handmade, and uh, on a limited budget. Uh, yeah. Or no budget. Now they. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm 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 retired now, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're, a lot of that stuff was my you're, stuff. You're budget. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because if I I I didn't want to have to depend on somebody else's resources to allow me to do what I wanted to do, and if they didn't have it and I couldn't get it, or they didn't want to spend money on it, I got it. Because to me, that was, that was a part of what I was doing, and I wasn't going to have it any other way. And if I didn't want to do it, I wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. And that's between, I didn't give a hoot. <laughs> if I wanted something up there, and it's what was going to take to make it look the way it should, then I had so much stuff at home from all, like vacation Bible school, all that kind of stuff. I did all kinds of craft work and sold it and all this kind of stuff. I knew how to make stuff. I didn't know one had to tell me how. I just did it. <laughs> and I had fun doing it. And you did. I, re I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, I re oh, that, that broke my heart when they told me I wasn't going to be doing them anymore. Right. And you know, that was just the last, what, two or three years? Was it 19, uh, 19, 2012, I think, is when I quit doing them. Yeah, all right. Yeah, because uh, we had, uh, oh, that was when they were building a math center. Uh, so, yeah. It would have been during that time period that I didn't do them anymore. But we had, then we, John discovered, well, we have a bulletin board. <laughs> so I did occasionally put things on the bulletin board for uh, just us, but they were a lot more simple. And, uh, and they stayed up a lot longer. And then it got to be, uh, when the math thing opened, we didn't have, the, so much space was taken up. And kids had gotten used to going somewhere else because we weren't open you know, for just anybody to walk in on a floor when all this stuff was going on. So uh, I put something on that bulletin board and it's been up there for years. <laughs> and it's it's all about the map room because there's, there's people who had no idea we even had a map room. I mean, there's no publicity or anything on it. Really, it's not right because that's a pretty big deal if you knew how expensive some of that stuff was. Um, of course, maybe it's just as well they don't. We probably had a lot of burglars or something. I'd hate to think somebody would ever break in there. But mm. Anyway, John's part-time, but he keeps that place working down there. <laughs> and I, I guess he's working another year. I have no idea. Well, I didn't either, but somebody said something, and I, I don't even remember who I was talking to, but I don't know, have a clue how long Connie's working. But, and then I, then I made the smart marks. I said, anything I can do part-time, is there? <laughs> They said, no, I don't remember, uh, I guess because I'm not a professional, but what would I do? Oh, well, if I'm worried, well, anyway, it was a flat out no. <laughs> nope. Once you quit, you're, you're done as far as clerical. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, you stay 10 years longer than most people. I, I mean, most would retire. Yeah, and, you know, everybody would ask me, they'd say, well, when are you going to retire? And uh, I'd say, I don't know. And then uh, and I, when it got past 65, I said, I like working here, and I have no reason to quit. And uh, I think it was, was it night, uh, 2006 or seven that Arthur died, so... Uh, I knew I was going to have to retire some, so I, but I, all of a sudden I just decided, okay, they took my display cases away from me, and uh, I didn't really have, feel like I had that much purpose anymore, and it wasn't the fun it used to be, so I said, okay, it's time to retire, but that made it, I'm, I'm going to be 75 next Monday, so I made it pretty good ways. You sure did. And working full time, too. Yeah. <laughs> And do it another time. Well, you know, I could do it a lot longer, but you gotta quit sometime. And uh, and uh, <laughs> I've been on. Uh, see, uh, see, when did I go home? So I was home all of this week by my. You know, I've had appointments and stuff, but I've actually been in my house. And I, I told my kids, I said, now when I retire, I'm gonna start getting rid of all this junk and stuff in my house because I have too much paper stuff and I'm one of them people who can't let loose of anything. So I said, I'm going to start straightening things up, make it a little neater and get rid of some of the stuff I don't really need. So the entire time I've been off, other than any appointments I've had, because I had to go talk to TWI Crip and get my... Matter of fact, I'm, I haven't even gotten it yet. I'm, they, they had to mail my retirement papers to me because I don't have a computer. <laughs> But anyway, so that ought to be waiting for me maybe this weekend. And, uh, but I've been spending this time that I've been, this is my only, my first week off from not having to work all day every day, cleaning my house and working all day doing it. So I, uh, I got to thinking, I thought, you know, this, my clothes are fitting a little different. But you know what it is? I'm not sitting at a desk doing not well, not nothing, but not moving. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when you're in front of a computer and your chair rolls around, you don't even get up out of your chair to do something. You just roll it around and reach for stuff. The only time I'd be moving was when I was running down the hall to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and, of course, it was clear at the other end of the building. And then you had to come all the way back. And uh, so I didn't really move around that much. I wasn't, everything I did was at my desk. I didn't have a whole lot of, I wasn't building displays anymore, and I got plenty of exercise doing that. But I've lost a, a pound and a half in a week just for cleaning the house. There you go. <laughs> so now when I get my housework done, <laughs> but I, I leave my TV on most of the time, and uh, I just kind of, in my favorite TV station, the Hallmark channels, two of them. <laughs> and if I've seen one on one, I flip it to the other one, but I've seen all of them at least five times. <laughs> But they're nice shows, so that's, that makes it pleasant to have something like that to, that I can keep me from dwelling on anything else I'm doing. And I, I haven't felt like I'm, um, like I haven't been working. Now I realize after a while they're going to be, um, of course if I'm not working in the house now when the weather is better, of course I have the winter to go through. I do lots of reading. The only trouble is I do too much reading. If it wasn't for my dog wanting outside, I'd be sitting on the couch all the time reading or doing something else. Uh, but I like working outdoors. So I might have more flowers this year than I've had. I might even start, you know, I used to have a big old vegetable garden, but I might get another one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the weather has been so hot and dry the last few, two or three of those years, I thought, it's not mm -hmm. worth it to try mm -hmm. to spend money to water them when it was going to take so much of my own water to make them live. So I just quit doing it. And, uh, but now you'll have the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but at some point, let's, you, I read in here, too, you had something to do with Elsa. Oh, yeah. You can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I don't, I don't. I think, it, as a matter of fact, I was on the committee that formed Elsa, and uh, I don't remember how in the world I got involved in it. I know David Peters, the few people that I remember, I know David Peters was on it, and, and along with me, and uh, some, uh, I don't remember too many clerical type people being in on it. I don't know if it's because they knew, I don't really know why, unless they knew that I, they could use my artistic abilities doing something. 
But I, I, I've always been active in the church, so I've always been somebody, it doesn't bother me to get in front of people. And I, I, I'm just me. I pretty much say things I shouldn't say. Because <laughs> uh, I figure, oh, well, I'm the one who's up here talking to them. If you don't like it, you can leave. <laughs> but I... I uh, was this what Dr. Johnson or Ralph was? I think Dr. Johnson, yeah. because I think it was his suggestion. He wanted... Uh, the library, the professionals and the, and the clerical staff were just two separate groups. They didn't mix. He wanted people who worked in the, in the library to uh, work with each other to make the library the place that he wanted it to be. And uh, he decided he wanted to have some a group of people who would uh, meet together and and create things that that would draw people together to intermix. In other words, he wanted the clerical staff to mix and do things with the professionals. In other words, there was you had an education, and and a lot of the clerical staff did too. But I I, I graduated from high school. I never went to college, but I but I had a, a good government job and mm -hmm. a responsible and I was a responsible person. So. Uh, and like I said, I've done a lot of leadership stuff in church, so I had the ability to do what anybody else was able to do, but just do it in a different different place. And uh, maybe I don't, like I said, I don't know how I even got on that committee, <laughs> but I was. And uh, there was quite a few of us because I remember we all sat on one of those really long tables. And uh, it's been so long ago I couldn't tell. A lot of the people are gone that that were on it. I think Martha Nemo was on it, and uh, like I said, I, I, I really don't remember, but I remember David Peters, and uh, but and we met several times. It didn't take us long to figure out what we wanted, and uh, we decided that we would have elections to have an Elsa chair and an assistant, somebody to help the social part of it, and then of course and then you had to have a treasurer because it took money to do stuff. And uh, I was trying to think who the uh, shoot Rich Boston boss. I was trying to think who was the first head of, head of Elsa. I don't, I don't remember, uh, yeah. but it was somewhere in there. I became the head, and uh, and I can't. It, Rich was either before me or after me, because I remember working with him, and he was one of those guys. He was a real character. He was a lot of fun to work with. But uh, you had to restrain him occasionally. <laughs> That's probably why we got along, because I was kind of footloose, too. <laughs> anyway, but we, we worked well together. And uh, uh, Do you remember how they came up with the name, the ac uh, acronym? Edmund Law Libraries. You know, it took us a while, and I don't know. We might have even voted on it. The library might have voted. See, I don't remember that much. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, and you were elect selected or awarded the yeah. uh, library. I don't. I, I guess employee the, award. I don't know. How, oh yeah. <laughs> In nineteen something, uh, nineteen ninety four, I think I read. Okay, like I said, I don't remember the years. That but, was an honor. Yeah, it was. And uh, uh, well, I think the, the main reason I got elected or got that award was because I did. I was active in Elsa and did a lot of stuff in the library. Plus, uh, I did a lot of things that I tried to help make the library a better, a pleasant place to be. <laughs> anyway, it was really nice that they gave that to me. Yeah, and, and uh, I was trying to think. <laughs> I didn't even get to go to my own dinner or nothing. I wasn't even at the awards. I was in Florida. John called me and told me I got it, and I wasn't even there. They had to have known before I left, because I left that weekend. Anyway, so I've always been mad at John about that. So my daughter had to substitute for me. I had to tell her. I says, okay, I'm not there, but they're going to... They have a meal you're supposed to go to. You're going to have to take my place. And I said, at the ward ceremony, I don't know what they were going to do, but... Uh, they gave her that certificate that had my name on it, but she was there to take it from them. <laughs> I forgot I wasn't even there. <laughs> I 
a gee whiz. One time I get something really nice like that, and it wasn't even there. <laughs> so John's fault. I need a do over. <laughs> oh well, but it was nice. I took I I enjoyed the glory. <laughs> Well, the library itself has changed quite a bit in those 31 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Including the big catalog disappearing. Or was it already gone when you started the no, no. one out here? I remember it? helping empty those drawers and throwing catalog cards away. I was sad. <laughs> oh, man. I got a picture because some other clerical staff helped too uh, of me and some other people from the doctor department sitting on these big piles of garbage bags because that's what was in them. And, you know, for some reason, it seems like we were down in the basement. We were down in the basement for some reason. It might, might have been when something else was going on, asbestos abatement maybe or something. No, it couldn't have been because, no, I don't think so. Anyway, scratch that. <laughs> but I remember all those bags of catalog cards. Yeah. And some of those you have type. Oh, well, well you know, I never, really, I never typed you any cards. Type. Nope. No, I never had to do that. I just, I was a cataloger, and like I said, I classified for a while. I thought, that, that always, it was, <laughs> that made me feel kind of special because I said, nobody else, no, no, no other clerk has ever been taught how to classify. But uh, I remember enough of it to, to know if I think they did it right. Because <laughs> John said I did it better than the librarians, and I've told that twice. And if John hears this, he'll say, I did. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of things that you could probably cut out of here. So. Oh, you've been great. <laughs> what do you want to miss the most? All the people. It's like having a big family. And because I worked in the same department all the time, and I did uh, stay fairly active most of the time, uh, you got to know each other. Now, I didn't always get along with everybody. Uh, <laughs> personality conflicts. But most of the people that I worked with, I enjoyed working with them. And uh, they never made me feel like I was just a clerk because I knew I had a lot of background that contributed to what I was doing. And, and uh, it was just something that was there. <laughs> and I decided to use it. So if, uh, if uh, there's no reason for somebody not to have a purpose, I mean, I can't imagine just doing nothing all your life. That would be so boring. But it's a lot of fun to be mixed in with people. Now, I'll be the first to admit, uh, I've, never, I've never thought of myself as a people person. But, I, but, you, you, but you know, because of the way I was brought up and the life I lived, you know, when I was younger, I felt, I felt like I was a lower class than the people that, that I went to school with. And uh, I wasn't active in school until, like, in my senior year of high school. And uh, the only reason I was, was active then was because I had a speech teacher where I learned to get up in front of people and speak and give oral um, uh, book reports and stuff on big books. I think I did one on Ben Hur, the real person, and I did a... Uh, Something on the Magnuson Obsession, which I read when I was, wasn't it? I wasn't. Even, I was in high school, but it was a lower level. And uh, but I loved to read, and but I lived vicariously. But I learned a lot from those stories because a lot of the stories I read were about real people or whoever was writing it wrote well. <laughs> in other words, it might have been fiction, but it was true to life. And. Uh, and then also with the background I had as far as where I worked and the seriousness of some of the things I saw when I was working for the FBI, uh, I was just well aware of the, my surroundings all the time. But I, I knew I had to mix with people. And uh, I just, it was just like, a, it just, little light bulbs come on and say, okay, if you want something done, do it yourself. And, uh, so I just got involved and started doing stuff and thought, well, hey, they like what I'm doing. <laughs> and I seem to know what I'm doing. I, if I can lead some old people and tell them what to do, why can't I handle the rest of them? <laughs> I mean, they aren't any different than I am. It's just I always, 
I, uh, I just felt like there were some people that I wasn't comfortable with because I didn't feel I was no, as knowledgeable as they were and as well trained. But uh, I life hope I never made you feel that way. <laughs> no way. You're a great person. I liked you the minute I saw you. <laughs> you were a good welcoming committee, I remember. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't pose, remember that far back. You had to pose for a picture the first day. Marion says. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I did take all the pictures in the office. I had a picture of every person that ever worked for John. I think that's amazing, really. <laughs> and he has them. Oh, you, yeah. He yeah. has them. No, I don't have them. Uh, yeah, a lot of those pictures. I, now, yeah. okay. It was on me, most of it. But I wanted to do it. And uh, if I, there was a few, I would keep for myself, but he got the, most of them, because I wanted to do it. He was a, he, he did a lot for us. Had a, a lot of respect for John and, uh, and for Vicki. Well, Vicki always... was just more serious, but John was more a person-to-person -person boss, because he would talk and tell you stories. <laughs> and John had, he had, because he did the hiking on the Appalachian Trails and all that, it was a lot of fun to hear him talk about stuff he had done. And through the years, when I was there, you made lots of birthday. Oh uh, yeah. Well, because I did birthday this. themed pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Some great times. And you know, uh, I just more or less took over. <laughs> it, I didn't see any point if if we're going to do something for somebody, and you know, we had that little break area. It didn't need to be just a table with food on it. I wanted to make that person it was for feel special. And I thought, well, if I can build a display, I can decorate this with something. This is hilarious. So it got to be anything that went on back there. Nobody ever, hardly ever tried to do anything themselves. They just assumed that I would do it. Mm -hmm. And if, if somebody else wanted to do it, I would gladly let them. But I probably wouldn't have liked it if they did. <laughs> Because I, um, I think you could say I'm a perfectionist when it comes to doing things a certain way. I think we knew that. <laughs> well, and, and benefited from that. Let's well, add that too. I, I don't like to put people down. And if, if somebody does something and I know they put everything they had into it, I respect them at least trying. <laughs> but not everybody can be good at what they do, but they can uh, work hard at it. Anyway, but see, I, I most of the people that I get along with the best though are people that uh, I think I can relate to. Like, you were just a down-home person to me, yeah. and you talked about your mom a lot. Yeah, and you uh, you even commented a few times. I, I knew when your mom passed away that you were really missing your mother, and every now and then I just felt like I, you needed me. <laughs> you were correct. <laughs> Yeah, but that's what I like to be that way. Because when I was growing up, I had lots of family, but there very few people who were unrelated that I had any association with. And I just, uh, I just got the feeling that I wasn't somebody they wanted to know or to get close to. But uh, I had. Uh, it's like having a, a hidden identity that I kept to myself. And uh, it was when I got out on my own and away from everything familiar that I thought, if something's going to get done, I've got to do it myself. But I was I uh, joined a church. First thing I did when I went to D.C. was I joined a church. And uh, uh, I would go to things that the, these church people were uh, involved in, little get-togethers they would have. And because uh, it was a church organization, a lot of the things we did uh, required people to uh, to put themselves like at the head of the group because nobody else would. Mm -hmm. And when it came for somebody to say a prayer, everybody would stand around kind of him like, well, it's not going to be me. I thought, I'll do it. And uh, I thought, I think that's what made me grow. I got secure. I thought, I'm, they're no better than me, but I at least will get up there and do what's expected of me. And I thought, they're going to have to learn. 
one of these days they're going to have to become an adult and uh, speak up. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think the church is what has made me what I am simply because I was active. I, you know, I, I taught Sunday school classes. I was in the church choirs, and uh, and uh, and I liked it. So you but, sing? Well, I used to. <laughs> Just let you demonstrate if you well, wish. Well, now, see, it just so happened that a lot of the places I became a member of the church, it was a big church, and they had they had large choirs, especially, uh, uh, trying to think, been enough places. There was one church in particular, and it was in, was this in, this was in Springfield, Illinois. There was a gigantic Christian church, but it looked like a cathedral. It was just one of those really old, great, big things. And it's where President Johnson went and some other presidents went. And, uh, and uh, I knew, I had a roommate. No, she wasn't a roommate. Somebody I had worked with. I knew where she went to church, and I knew she was in the choir. She said, you have to audition. A lot of those people were paid professional singers, you know, the ones who did the solos and stuff. And I thought, oh. They aren't going to let me in there. I said, I don't, I didn't know how to read music. I sing my ear. I'd hear one note and I just knew where I was supposed to go as long as I followed it. If I knew which notes were going up and which ones were going down. I don't know how I knew it. I just did. And, uh, and, and I did have a good voice because when we, I, for some reason, this girl told the choir director that I wanted to join the choir, and he took her word that I could sing. I don't know if he's busy or what it was, but I got in that choir, <laughs> and uh, and it was it was really neat. <laughs> but I thought they didn't know that I couldn't read the music, but boy, I was there for those choir practices, and I, I followed well, <laughs> and they had some really good instructors because these were big places, and they were showing these people who were professionals what to do. So I, I listened and learned. But just about every church I went to it was like that. I never told them that I couldn't read music. I just toughed it out. And there was a few people that they, it was like you knew they were wondering. <laughs> but I, because I sang well enough, they would let me stay. And I even got to, in a, it was in Springfield. So I'm getting my, that was Washington, D.C. that I was in that big church. That's where I was. Yeah, so, yeah, because I, the, the, the choir would leave, and we went into underneath the, the, the church in a tunnel-like area. That's where the president would leave. Cool. And I even remember walking shoulder to shoulder with President Johnson going up back to the choir room where it, wherever he was going back to the White House or wherever. But uh, he's the only president I remember, but I know there was others there. But uh but that that was <laughs> I I love to tell my kids that. <laughs> anyway, you see I, I've been so many places I forget where I'm at when I'm doing it. But that was Washington DC. But uh in Springfield, Illinois they had a great big church with a big choir and pretty much the same thing happened there. <laughs> That's neat. You've had an interest in life, man. I have had. But, you know, my kids told me, they said, Mom, you never talked about your childhood. I didn't realize I didn't because I was around my family so much. It just seemed like if everything I knew they were going to know, too, from just hearing the others talk. But uh, they told me when I retired, they wanted me to write a journal of my life, which is pretty much what I'm doing with you. And that's what they're wanting from me. And I did start it a couple of years ago, and then I quit. I said, I'll wait until I retire to actually do it, because it's very time-consuming. Plus, I don't have a computer, so every time I'd make a mistake or leave something out, I'd have to go all the way back and just add to it, and then it'd all be in the wrong order. But I am going to do that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, do you have anything on your bucket list? Any, any place or thing you want to uh, do to have it? No, I don't. Don't even have a bucket list? No, I don't. Besides finishing, besides oh, well, starting that's, and finishing, that's that. just that's that was a request. As I had done enough in my life, uh, it sure hadn't been boring, uh, and I've always been pretty active in in the towns I've been in. And uh, I'd probably say this is probably the least active I've ever been. 
It's, 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 when Arthur died, I got tired of going to church by myself. So I got to where I, would, I watched uh, two, sometimes three church services Sunday mornings on TV. And uh, I uh, make myself sit there and actually listen and watch and not do something else while I'm doing it. But it, it's, uh, it's, I know I should be mixing and having fellowship with other people in the church, but <sighs> churches are so big anymore, you're just lost in the crowd. And uh, it, was, it was hard for me to make it to... I don't drive well. I, I, I can drive at night, but I don't see very well. I don't see as well as I should at night. So I don't, I don't go many places at night. And all choir practices are in the evenings. Mm -hmm. So I quit going to uh, being involved in the choir. But I sing my lungs out when I'm in church to sing because I have a loud voice. You know, when I, I was a song uh, leader in uh, Perkins at the Christian church there, and the... It was an old church, so there was a lot of old people there, and they they just about broke my neck hugging me when they found out I was going to go to church there because they needed young people. <laughs> now, when I say young people, I mean somebody that's not 70. <laughs> but I, I've always uh, been able to uh, put it out there. In other words... I probably have the loudest laugh, and I get excited, I talk loud, and when I'm singing, I sing loud, unless I'm being told, you know, to be quiet. I can't control myself. But because I was a song leader, I sang loud so all the old people out there could hear. If they didn't know the song, they knew it before they were done, because they could hear me, and I really enjoyed it. But they liked me because they could hear me. <laughs> Did you have a favorite song? If you, had oh. to, if you had to pick church song. Oh, I've always, I don't know why, but I've always liked that song, It Is Well, with my soul. Is, I don't even know the name of it. I think that's the name, isn't it? Probably It Is Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I, and I love uh, uh, Our Father. Uh, see, see, a lot of these things, I sing them, but I don't even know what the titles are. Uh, but, I, I, yeah, I love church music. Can't play it, can't follow it but I can sing it. <laughs> I'll Fly Away is my favorite. Oh yeah that is it. Yeah I remember a lot of those neat what I call old, old songs. Old songs. <laughs> yeah. That was the old country churches used to sing because I, I was a member of a lot of older churches and uh, but I was always in the choir and uh, no, I don't do it anymore. <laughs> Maybe now that you're retired you will. Well you know when uh, I was in high school and uh, going to a lot of these family get-togethers we would go to uh, sometimes they would they would ask me to they would hand me a hymnal and ask me to sing a song for them so here's my whole family gathered around me and I'm the one who's singing to them <laughs> that was neat that's neat yeah. yeah it was I mean I was just a high school kid <laughs> good memories mixed in there yeah, yeah. See, the longer you sit, I don't know how long I've been sitting here, but the longer I sit here, you realize I could talk all day long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pardon? Am I laughing too now? No. You're doing great. Three hours. Really? Almost. I've been here three hours? Almost. You can't. My gosh. <laughs> and I just started. <laughs> now where do you want to go? <laughs> what, have we, what have we skipped? Oh, that's what I was looking like at. I said, I'm not very organized. When I get to talking, there's too many things that come to mind, and if I don't say them, then I'll forget them. Just like in the middle of a sentence, I forget where I'm going. Well, do you have a favorite memory of the library? Anything that just jumps out? Well, I can remember a few occasions when we had special people come here, like uh, uh, President Bush came. Did you know he was here? I knew he was here, but I didn't know he came to the library. Oh, well, he didn't come to the library. I just, no, okay, you're talking about the library itself. Well, you know, I hate to say it, but I, <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't think of anything right now because to me, the library, everything that goes on here is, it interests me. And uh, well, I'm just glad to be a part of it. It's been intertwined with your life yeah. for 30 years. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's a whole lot. And Oklahoma's home. You consider Oklahoma oh, home. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, then my last question. When history's written, what would you like for it to say about you? 
How do you want to be remembered? Well, you know, I like to think of myself in the in the same manner that Will Rogers. So. I mean, I try to like everybody I meet. And if I don't like them, I'm not going to let them know it. And uh, I just enjoy, I just enjoy being a friend to people. I like to know that, uh, I'd like people to think that I'm somebody they can count on. I've always said that uh, anything I, if you can't do something, well, uh, if you can't do something well, then don't do it. But whatever you're doing, work, uh, do your best, in other words. Do the best you can do with what you've got. In other words, don't do anything halfway. Don't bother doing it. So it really bugs me to see people who will who will do things that I know they could do better because cause they, they just don't want to do it. But um, anybody who I've ever worked for, if they tell me to do something, I'm going to do it because they asked me to and they are my boss. But I would never do anything that was, nobody's ever asked me to do anything that was illegal or, you know, uh, shouldn't be done. You go get me sidetracked, I'll get on my political box. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's something else. Is uh, I don't when I'm in the office, I've always, of course, working for the FBI and the government. You never talk politics, and uh, it's just I worked for them long enough. It's ingrained in me because uh, I have my opinions on things, but unless I'm talking privately to somebody, you're not going to know what they are. I'm not. I hate hearing people debating each other. And I don't agree with them. I don't want to hear it. But I hear it all the time. <laughs> and it really gets me. I say, I don't want to hear what you're talking about. And I have my opinion, you have yours, but I don't have to listen to them. <laughs> unless I'm in the conversation with you. <laughs> anyway, I just, I don't ever talk politics. I figure it's nobody business of mine. I'm the only one that can make that little check mark. Now, if, if it's a serious get-together where somebody's actually asking me something and it's more private and not something that's like I'm standing around broadcasting, I'll, I'll tell them what I think, but they have to really want to know because they probably, they probably won't like what I have to say because <laughs> I've been in enough different places to see uh, the divisions that can be caused by people's opinions of certain things when... It has nothing to do with what they're being paid to do or, you know, I'm talking about myself or their job. It has nothing to do with their job. It's just something personal. I mean, we live in a country where we elect people by choice. And uh, if you don't like it, tough turkey, you make do with what you got. <laughs> I have no brilliant statements. I just like, I just want people to like me. I think mission accomplished then, Mary. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> and I thank you for talking with us today. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sorry I muddled around. And oh, <laughs> we're going to miss you around here. Let's, see, let's end it that way. We will uh, miss you Oh, around this has here. been a great place to work. I can't think of a better place. Nope. You know, it's totally different than working for the FBI because it was, uh, it was just more... Uh, subdued as far as you didn't get to know your the people you worked with as well everybody was pretty much close mouth <laughs> well here's like a family i mean you've yeah. been here long enough and, yeah but when it they really start is. to leave it gets sad so oh i know well i there's a lot of people's left that i miss too but uh i live close enough and i live in town i can cop over here anytime i want oh i'm thankful our paths cross so <laughs> and uh I just know that I'll, I'll make some visits, and I know it'll probably get to where I'll, nah, there won't be anybody here that knows me anymore after a while, so. But while there's someone here that I do know, I'll make occasional little trips back here. Okay. Just like I'll probably stop in the office today, and it seemed like there was something I was going to get, and I don't remember now what it was. I've <laughs> been here too long, I forgot. <laughs> Well, but I'll, you've been a really special person, you know, Tanya. I just, I just, we've gotten along well ever since you walked in the door. Yeah, I think so too. So, <laughs> happy birthday, happy retirement. 
Happy trails. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll close. Okay.